ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. The uh, May 2nd, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which will extend or which do extend remote participation in public meetings until March 31st, 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All materials for the meeting can be found at the link I'm entering in the chat now. I'll re-enter that when folks join because they won't otherwise be able to see that link. So if you see it pop up a couple of times, that's why. Chuck Taroni is our commission chair. He'll facilitate tonight's meeting. There will be a public comment period for each hearing. Each vote taken during the meeting will be conducted via roll call vote, and we begin with roll call attendance. Chuck, mm -hmm. here for attendance and agenda review. Sure. So we'll just do the attendance first. Uh, Mike Gildas game. Here. Brian McBride. Here. Susan Chapnick. Here. David Kaplan. Here. David White. Here. Nathaniel Stevens. Here. And Chuck Taroni is here. Um, Associate Member Eileen Coleman. Here. And Sarah Alfranco. Alfaro Franco. Yep. Present. Thank you. Uh, on tonight's agenda, we have administrative uh, review, uh, administrative report, some discussion items, or two enforcement orders for 66 um, Dudley Street and 34 Dudley Street. Our hearings start with uh, ADA Coolidge, which will be continued tonight and uh, to our next meeting. And then we'll go on to Thorndike Place, uh, which is uh, second on the hearings list. And then a request for an amendment for the 869 Massachusetts Ave, which is the high school. And if we get through that, we'll go on to um, take up the extension of that order of conditions. And with that, I'll go back to the beginning of the agenda and just say that tonight's minutes, uh, we're gonna, we're just gonna uh, continue those to our next meeting. And so we won't need a vote on that tonight. And then uh, correspondence received. So we receive a lot of correspondence uh, when we get uh, some, you know, uh, very high profile hearings and we received a lot. Uh, some of the correspondence that we received today may not be counted or up on the website yet, but uh, anything between the two meetings would certainly be up on our website. So if you would like a list um, of the correspondence or you should like to check that out yourself, uh, correspondence is available to the public and for a full list, contact the conservation agent and he's going to put in his uh, contact in the chat right now. Next on the agenda, we have an administrative report, but um, that administrative report is this is just for the Conservation Commission and it's on the agenda and we've added this for the administrator to give a report and that will allow David Morgan to update us on notable activity uh, during the meeting, such as site visits, enforcement actions, uh, last minute issues that uh, he would like to bring up to the attention of the Conservation Commission. And we're going to start that uh, on the agenda at our next meeting. And with that, uh, we're down to discussion items and the committee members that usually give an update on all our committees also has been continued to our next meeting. So the first item on our agenda tonight is 6666 R Dudley Street, which is an enforcement action. And David uh, has drafted an enforcement order for um, 6666R uh, Dudley Street, and it also includes the Brook uh, Millbrook Condominium. Um, and uh, both owners, I'm not sure, but I'm hoping both owners are here tonight so we can discuss this. And if we have a good discussion, we'll be able to finalize those enforcement orders and start moving forward on this. So I'm going to ask David Morgan to bring us up to get date in regards to the enforcement order and any of the action that he's uh, discussed with these two owners. Sure. In the interim, can somebody manage the waiting room? Maybe, Susan, could I ask you 
to manage the waiting room. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I can watch it too. Mm -hmm. You do you have privileges to do that already? I don't. Let me see if I do. No, I haven't seen them come up. It hasn't said so. If I had privileges, it would say somebody's in the waiting room, but it has not. So I guess I don't have privileges. You should now be a co-host, and okay. hopefully that will take care of things. Okay. So um, here is a report on 66 Dudley. You all have seen, uh, the commissioners have seen the memo that I put together, a uh, history of violations going back to 2016, at least 2016. Um, those are enumerated here, one through five, and there is uh, grounds for enforcement under the Wetlands Protection Act and our local bylaw, because many of these violations involve fill within the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. Fill is treated as a sort of perpetual or continuing violation and renews with each day that the fill is left in place. So uh, the fencing, you'll also see removal of a number of trees, which is not fill. That's the only one that doesn't count under that um, sort of statute of limitations. Installation of the parking patio second stone patio that was added, adding uh, gravel fill. All along there's been regrading and uh, some sort of cosmetic work and then the extension of the stone wall, which is the most recent activity filling that area behind uh, the stone wall that's closest to Mill Brook. So again, all of these were within jurisdictional areas, basically the whole site is jurisdictional. And a lot of this activity happened within floodplain and more concerningly floodway. And a lot of the activity happened off of the property of 6666R Dudley Street. So I gave an estimate below here saying that roughly 4,000 feet of the property at 6666R was converted from forested upland to hard packed gravel, dirt, and patio. And then there's an additional 1,500 square foot feet, rather, of the adjoining property that's been converted. You can imagine this is all side yard, it's all contiguous, it's all been converted basically to a contractor's yard. And the adjoining property, as uh, Chuck explained at the top of this section, is the 993-995 Millbrook Condo Association building on Mass Ave. So I have sent this memo that we're looking at now to the owners of 6666 R Dudley Street and discussed the matter with uh, Chuck and Susan, our chair and co-chair, and also touched base with Nathaniel Stevens about the statute of limitations and also with you know folks internally here to make sure that you know that this is on the up and up in terms of enforcement. And indeed it is, as I said, the the fill issues are enforceable going back to whenever the violation started. The deal with the condo association is that uh, when Chuck, Susan, and I spoke, we decided to discuss here the prospect of issuing the enforcement order for the Dudley Street address and the condo association, because under the law, the condo association is responsible for the activity that happened on their land. And again, that's about 50, 100 square feet of fill and other activities that transpired or were undertaken on the condo association's land. So with that, I sort of turn it 
back to you all for discussion about how to proceed and I'm happy to ask or answer any questions as you see fit. Thanks, David. That was uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, so I've, I see that the enforcement order for uh, 66 and 60 are you're asking for a restoration plan shall be uh, completed. And is that what you're looking for for the 4,000 square feet at this moment? Chuck, the rest, the um, enforcement oh. order is not up on the screen. Did did you mean to do that if you're talking about it? No, I did not mean oh. to do that. It's a, oh. I, I think that we all we all saw it, but it can go up on the screen oh, okay. if that's if that's uh, no, it's okay. What you I'm want? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, David, is that what you're looking for? The four thousand square feet of restoration. And my follow up question would be, how is that divided between the two properties? Hmm. So, in total, it's fifty five hundred square feet, and these are rough estimates. You know, I'm I'm going off of the aerial view and trying to estimate. So, in reality, if you got a surveyor in the field, it may be a different number. Um, regardless, it's roughly fifty five hundred square feet of total land that's been impacted. 1,500 of that is on the condo association's property and 4,000 is on the Dudley Street property. So I would be, the proposal is that this needs to be fixed either way. It's, it's also a zoning violation to fill in the floodway. But I think that the Conservation Commission was the first to enforce on this matter and I would we require more. And so the commission should go first in terms of enforcement and, uh, and pursue a restoration plan. Sure. Is the uh, zoning officer going to uh wait for our direction or is this something uh, that they're just going to do independently of our actions? Uh, they're going to issue a notice and then it will all depend on their findings. They'll do their own investigation. Naturally, we don't oversee zoning. We have nothing to do with their enforcement, but I think that the um, Inspectional Services Department would want to wait for the commission to make a decision about how to move forward before making any requirements, because again, our our plans would affect how they proceed. Sure. Uh, with that, I see that Nathaniel has his hand up. Nathaniel, please um, unmute and ask your question. Thanks, Chuck. Um, David, I was hoping you could just spin through quickly without... Uh, spending too much time on it. the aer aerial photos you have attached to your memo i can see the I, I can see what you're showing in the street views but i wasn't if you could just show what you're trying to show with those aerial photos if anything i think that would be helpful and maybe i'm just having trouble reading them because they're most a lot of them have tree vegetation you know covering the area yes i can do that Thanks. Susan, I, I'm seeing a lot of folks coming in still. Are you not getting those notifications? I am, and I'm doing it as fast as I can and taking notes, so trying. <laughs> Thanks. David, you can make me co-host. I can, I can do some of that too. All right. I'm familiar with the process. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, so here is a aerial view of the property, well, the subject site, I guess you would call it, uh, in 2014. And you'll notice, you know, full canopy cover on the site going all the way down to Mill Brook, which is underneath this part of the canopy. If you can see my cursor moving there, it's to the north of the parking lot for the condo association. Can you point out the property line on that one? It's yep. pretty visible. Yep. Yellow lines are property lines. The 
condo association comes all the way up to the public right of way over here on the western edge and the they own both sides of Mill Brook, uh, extending all the way. I think this is something like a hundred feet um, to Dudley. So from this juncture all the way down to the other side of the parking lot is all owned by the condo association. And then it's, it's just basically a timeline of the uh, violations from here. So here's 2015, likely um, some activity underneath that tree canopy that we're not seeing, but that would just probably be the fence, which you can see in this picture from 2016 has been installed. Here is later in 2016, I believe, um, and I would need to check against the timeline in my memo, but um, I, I think that this coincides, can somebody double check my math as I'm reading this? This coincides with the initial uh, violation letter. And so what I think we're looking at here, although it's not very clear, is the um, uh -huh. work with regrading and so forth starting to transpire. 17, 2018, you can certainly start to see the encroachment from uh, off the property line towards Mill Brook. This is all um, starting to be hardened and filled. 2019, you have the initial uh, patio parking lot installed. Hmm. Hard to tell if there's anything going on down here, but um, it's obviously been altered. The trees have been removed, um, possibly hardened up to Millbrook Bank. Uh, this is 2020. By now, we have the uh, gravel fill. It's also evident in this picture, sort of change in surface by 2021. And then definitely 2022, um, this is like the, the full build out of the second patio, which is, mm. and the additional gravel fill up to the line with that. And this is all uh, built out sort of, you can see the granite curbing in there a bit with the sort of garden area behind it. Yeah, and I think we're pretty good with seeing that it was um, the extent of this. Now, those little details um, I get. I think the big picture is we saw that it was filled up to the up to Millbrook. So, um, Nathan, did you have any other questions? We have three commissioners waiting to ask sorry, questions. Thanks. No, that, thank you, David. That was helpful to see and hear. Thanks. Sure. Look, look forward to hearing what the property owners have to say. If anything further later. Mike, sure. Mike Gill, this game. Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering, David, if you're looking for some specific action from the commission tonight. So I've drafted a an enforcement order to cover all of these violations. And I would look for the commission to ratify. And at first, I would say, direct me to issue and then ratify the enforcement order for the Dudley Street property. The question I'm putting to you is, should it also go to the condo association? I also have one drafted that can go out to them. Thank you. Uh, David Kaplan. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. I noticed that the aerial exhibits, they get cropped um, towards the southeastern portion of the property. Was there no presumptive activity in that in that area? That's a good question. These were put together by Ryan Clapp. 
I don't have access to this technology that he used for the aerial views. And okay. um, I don't know if that's just the tiling of the aerials, how they get patchwork together, or if it's, you know, just he didn't recognize that the property extended down that far, but um, we could look into it further. When we were on site uh, for site visits and so forth, we wondered the same and asked the property owner about it and um, had it explained to us that there really wasn't any activity over there. It's just kind of, it's paved, you know, it's it's been paved going all the way back to the initial violations that I've noticed. And so I don't think that there could really be much, but. Um, would, would it be worth uh, investigating before we, I mean, you've outlined estimated quantities and, you know, um, you know you've qualified and quantified the work. Um, is it worth investigating further before we ratify and move forward? Or is that something we can move forward without um, that being investigated. I, I would leave that to the commission to decide. I, I would say that my gut feeling is that there's nothing additional back there, but um, it could be something that could be added to the enforcement order later. You know, we, we don't necessarily close out the enforcement order because we received a restoration plan. It's just, you know, we find more violations we can add to them. Great. No, that's helpful. Thank you, David. Sure. Uh, um, another question? No, I was just about to say I don't have any more questions. Thank sure. you. Uh, uh, Brian McBride? Yeah, I was just wondering, so we visited in, when was that, December or something? We we had a, a, a letter written about a plan. And so I'm just wanting to clarify, this uh, new enforcement order will subsume or override any previous planning or discussion that we've had with this um, this uh, property owner. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, uh, that yeah, that's true. We can update our enforcement orders as long as they're ratified by the Conservation Commission. Nathaniel Stevens has his hand up. Thanks. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, I would be in favor of issuing an enforcement order to the Condo Association as well, just to, I think that'll make the enforcement proceedings run more smoothly. And I I understand that, David, I would like to quantify better exactly how much fill and where that fill is going to be removed. I think it's, I mean, David's has done as best as he can, just you know, sketching it out on aerial photos. But I think as it's now presented, it's not very specific to the, to, it's not mm. specific enough. So I think we need to work on that somehow you know, measuring from the top of uh, the top of the bank or something like that, uh, the edge of Mill Mill Brook, um, certain dimensions, get it on a better plan, um, so we can quantify this because it's otherwise it's a bit vague to enforce just just by saying approximately fifteen hundred square feet on the condo property. Um, well, actually, I, I said condo pro condo property is easier easy because that's completely. Con um, consumed, but uh, the other property, if just saying 4,000 square feet approximately, that really doesn't give the property owner any concrete direction about what to do, but where. Those are my comments. That's a fair point, Nathaniel. I wonder, could to those people that want to delay it, could we make a... Um, Why do Some people don't like turf fields. Uh, uh, could we make that incumbent on the the violator in order to get the sur a survey done in order to compare with potentially a baseline plan to see how much fill has been added? I I think that's hard to do. I think we might look to see what's online. If there's a mortgage survey plan, if there's another plan of the property that we could use, I think just uh, even even going to the, using the, I think the GIS system maybe that the town has to get a assessor's map plan to mark that up might be better than sort of what we have now. 
I think marking that up somehow to indicate that should give us, yeah, we can do a, a sketch plan at that point, but I think that would better define than what we have. We would attach that to an enforcement order because when we were at the, at the site, we discussed with the property owner at least a buffer of you know, 15, 20 feet, I think, in certain portions. So I think putting that on the, on the you know, indicating that on a plan or a, a sketch of some sort is going to be better. So I, I think, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to move this forward, but I don't think we should rush it tonight uh, until we get a better sense of what we're going to do. And David, I'm happy to try to work with you to to nail this down and detail it uh, and present it to the commission at the next meeting. That's so I, I had some comments just to, not exactly in line with what Nathaniel just said, but um, I see that the commission on these, and I have the original enforcement order in front of me that asked for a notice of intent. So I don't know if all the language was changed, but what I'm focusing in is the restoration plan shall be completed. And when I read that, I didn't think, um, I didn't think that uh, the either the condo or 66R would uh, attempt that by themselves and they would look for um, consultant to help them with that process. It's not required. And I understand that's the direction that seemed Nathaniel was doing and going in, but he was putting all that work on the conservation commission. I would, I would change this up a little bit and say, this is the enforcement order. We want a, we want a restoration plan. It has to be professional. It has to be on, uh, it has to be, on a plan so we can see what the restoration is happening and all those things about how much dirt is being removed that can also be presented at the next meeting but by their consultants or by these applicants these these two individuals and with that um i think it would be less work for david and um less work for david and we could get the information that that we need uh, and the last point was we're all focusing on removal. And I think if a, if a consultant's involved, they could look at things at like how much damage will be caused if all that material is moved. Is that worth removing the dirt? And maybe a, present a different plan um, to the commission that makes sense. So with that, I'll let Nathaniel Stevens uh, talk again. Thanks, Chuck. Yes, I, I didn't mean to go so far as to say that we would present, we would do all that assessment or that we would propose a restoration plan. I'm just concerned that if we just tell a consultant that there's 4,000 square feet of fill, they're going to ask where. I mean, it's it's really our our burden at this point to define what the area is that we want addressed. I, mean, I agree with you, you know, maybe removing the fill is not the thing to do, but you know, maybe there's some sort of other restoration that can be done, but we've got to better define wh where the, where the violation is, um, you know, and where exactly what areas we want addressed, I guess. Um, sure. That makes more sense. So, uh, just a demarcation line on the plan and then a list of uh, restoration items to consider and then come back with the restoration plan I and agree. a discussion. Yeah. yeah, thanks. No, helpful, good points, thanks. But I am also looking forward to hearing if what either of the yeah. partners has to say if they're here. I think I see one of them, but I'm not sure. I don't know if they want to speak, but I think they should be given the opportunity. Sure, uh, let's see, we have, uh, I don't have any names for uh, the condo association, but I have Robert uh, Casaluccio and Salvatore LaRusso. Uh, yes, that would be me. Sure. Me uh, stepping in for them. Okay. You heard what we had to say uh, and our suggestions. What <laughs> Can you update us? Um, okay. My screen just kind of went dark. Oh, Wait. we can see you still. Oh, okay. If, Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess what Nathaniel said earlier is we're now adding to the violation. So we're the the original one back in December, then we're disregarding that and now we we've added more. That's from David's um his last uh 
email that he sent me with with all the uh, aerial shots. So I, I just want to be clear, we've added on instead of fixing what we we're going to fix. Yeah, I, it would it would seem like that, but I would I would actually say that we've added more to the discussion at this point. Okay. Um, and as I alluded to, there may be circumstances where it wouldn't make sense to do all that removal. Okay. You know, so that just... kind of information coming from the applicant isn't yeah. isn't going to be you know received by the commission as well as if it came from a consultant. So that's why we were saying that it might be something you would want to entertain is to get some professional help to, uh, you know, get okay. you to the next step. And what do you, what do you suggest? Who do you suggest would help with that? What type of, I mean, we're landscapers, so we don't, you know, I don't, we don't look for anybody. I, I don't know if you're wanting an, an architect or so as far as um, that kind of information, you would mm -hmm. reach out to David Morgan at the office after this meeting, Friday morning or something like that, and he could help you in that regard. Okay. So um, all whatever work we've already done then, so we're just going to disregard that. We would like to maintain the erosion control. Mm -hmm. We'd like you to pick up the area and it's stay okay. out of it. Okay. okay? there's a certain area of that property that is going to return to its natural conditions. So we demarcated an area that was for a buffer strip. Wouldn't like to see anything there. You should pull the, you know, whatever. we're not gonna change the enforcement order again, but you shouldn't be doing anything in that area. Okay. Right, right. Well, whatever you guys had spoke about, we've you had two meetings, there were two meetings um, there. So with Sal, so, and I know that you've discussed, a, a, you know, doing uh, cleaning and so forth. So he's already done that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my bottom line is you just tell me now what, what I need to do, what, what going forward, except, I mean, I can talk to David, but how do we, what, what do I need to do going forward? So the commission is, is, so this may be part of your question. The commission is not going to, um, create a plan for you to follow. We're going to review one and we're asking you to bring a plan to us right. that has to do with the information that David set out, which is approximately 5,500 square feet of fill, some restoration on something that's happened since 2016. Many trees have been taken away. We would like you to get us a plan that we can understand. So a professional plan surveyed in with some, uh, well, it, it asks for a restoration plan and that would also come from either a wetland scientist or a consultant. Um, again, I'm, right, it's to... not up to staff to, to develop these plans, but if you tried to do it yourself, which it seems like you have some experience, uh, that part, may be okay, but I would call David in the morning and talk this through a little bit more. Okay. Um, I saw out of the corner of my eye, anybody have any, anyone else to, else to say on the commission about this? Uh, I wanted to give some final direction, but I thought maybe David Morgan would do that. Sure. I, I guess, Chuck, yes, I do. I think, in fairness to Evelyn, I think we need to, as I was trying to convey before, I think before we even issue the enforcement order and ask her, give her date to do a restoration plan, we need to better define what where that 40, where that 5,500 square feet is on the property. Because otherwise it's unfair to her to guess what we're alluding to. I think we need, again, just going to an assessor's plan or somebody to mark it up and, uh, or a better aerial, aerial photograph so she has some sense of a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to give to a consultant because again as if you send it to a consultant guarantee they're going to call the office and ask david wh where exactly is, what 4500 square feet are you talking about i think um and what area too uh, so and and also in fairness to the applicant i think if they've done certain measures i don't think we necessarily want to throw out all those measures that they've done i think we ask them to do them to do those and in fairness we should consider that and try to have any restoration 
plan. I'm thinking ahead. Any restoration plan, you know, uh, mm -hmm. utilize those mitigation measures if it makes sense. So, yeah, and I, hopefully, I would agree with that. I yeah. was going to say they already did some things like clean up and erosion controls, and we wanted that done, and that's going to help no matter what. So those should be ga gathered under the umbrella of the new restoration plan. Okay. I guess I'm saying I'm not ready to vote tonight on the rest on an enforcement order until we nail down exactly the area that we're talking about on the property. Does David have to come back to do I know you're going to work with him, Nathaniel. Do you does David have to come back to the commission with this demarcation line and list of to do's? I know Susan's shaking her head, but I think we have I'm waiting for a restoration plan so we can decide whether that is a good fix or not. I mean I think David knows what we're looking for. He probably is going to ask for more than what we're looking for. But um, is this something that you can just mark up a plan and hand to Evelyn and then she can talk about consultants or does that come back to the commission? I would suggest that it should come back to the commission. So we're, we're all in agreement on that area because if David marks up 5,500 square feet and those of us who've been to the site don't agree, necessarily agree where, what what that is, then I think we should have a discussion about it. Um, okay. You know, I, you know, again, I don't even know, you know, maybe the 5,500 feet covers the area that they've already done mitigation in, and maybe that's it. You know, again, I don't know. That's the problem. I'm having problem. I'm, I, I can't conceptualize where 5,500 square feet is on, on this property and on the site. So maybe, you know, maybe they've done already mitigated 4,000 square feet of it. I don't, I just don't know. So I just think we're, we don't have enough information. So that'd be my suggestion is to, um, you know, we're, I'm happy to work with David to try to nail this down a bit more and then have the commission review it and then to, to decide, you know, maybe they'll decide, maybe the commission will collectively decide, okay, only 3,500 makes sense or, you know, they want the, want that. But again, and David, again, was just guesstimating based on aerial photos. So I think we need to be more, much more precise than we are now. I agree. Okay. For next steps, I can work with Nathaniel to dial that in and get an accurate map and hopefully also compare that with a plan, like the assessor's plan for the site so that we can have dimensions and potentially even dates All right. determined when we bring it back to both parties, the Dudley Street and Mass Ave property owners. I was going to ask if anyone is here from the condo association representing them or wanted to speak. I guess not. I don't see any hands up. I don't know if anyone else does, but okay. Guess not. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, let's, so Evelyn, um, I would still suggest you reach out to David tomorrow if you needed time to look for help, uh, you know, consultants to help you with this. The more time you have, the better, probably based on the season we're getting into. So um, other than that, we'll just ask you to come back to our next meeting. What's the date of that, Chuck? May 17th? 16th. 16th. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, 34 Dudley Street is another enforcement item. Uh, and David has also drafted an enforcement order for 34 Dudley Street. Uh, so I'm not sure if the owner or the representatives are here for 34 Dudley Street. So I'm going to ask David to take it from here and request that he updates the Conservation Commission on the work or the violations that occurred on 34 Dudley Street. David Morgan? Yes, the, uh, sorry, the applicant who has a order of conditions for this site is not attending tonight, so I'm just presenting the violations. There were four oak trees taken down from the property that were not indicated on the site plan when the uh, commission approved the order of conditions. There are photos 
from the site. They're pretty large trees. And the uh, trees were taken down because the retaining wall that was previously on the site was a rock gabion wall that was a miracle that it held together. I mean, this was like, you know, chain link fencing with rocks falling down a hill. And so when they removed that quote unquote retaining wall, they found that the slope was too unstable for the plan as was presented to the commission, which was to leave the slope in its sort of natural state. So instead they're going to replace the retaining wall will be pulled back from the location of the initial retaining wall. And in order to accomplish the installation of the retaining wall, these trees were removed. So there are four trees that were removed. Um, obviously this photo is just showing three, but there's a fourth I can pull up here. Um, and the request to the commission is to ratify the enforcement order that says that they need to replace these trees with the number that are required by our section 24 of our regulations. Here's the other tree, quite a large one. So the replacement rate is four per uh, tree of this size. There are also another four trees that were indicated on the plan that are elm trees as potentially being taken down. Um, they were in fact removed. So uh, I would suggest that we add the four elm trees to the enforcement order along with the four oak trees, get a total probably of 32 and uh, they would be liable to replace those trees on site. Shall I stop there? Any questions? Chuck, I'll just jump in if I can. Um, will they be coming to us for an amendment? No. So I, I spoke with the applicant today, as a matter of fact, but I've been speaking with the applicant about the replacement and it's basically replacement in kind. The change is so minor in nature that I didn't think it warranted commission review. It's not going to impact any resource areas. It's basically within the footprint of what was going to be asphalt uh, for their driveway slash parking lot anyway and uh, it's outside of the 25 foot uh, no disturb zone as well so i felt comfortable with it being a minor change reflected on the as bill okay yeah that sounds good to me i was just also a second question is uh, our comment for the commission really is are we comfortable just saying plant the trees or do we want david to review where those trees go or do we want the full commission to review where those trees would go. I believe the enforcement order says come back with the restoration plan and the VA is the consultant. They represented to me today that they would be coming back with not just trees, but also shrubbery and uh, other vegetation to stabilize the slope there. Also just to soften the view from Wellington Park because there's gonna be you know, a foot uh, concrete retaining wall. So it'll, be more aesthetically pleasing. So I, I think that they will be coming back to us with that restoration plan inclusive of all of the trees and more. Okay, thanks. I'll make all a right. motion to approve the enforcement order. A second. 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 Uh, Mike killed this game. I'll give it to you, Can Mike. We so that was that was Nathaniel and who seconded? Mike killed this game. Mike. Okay. 
um, Brian McBride. Um, before you, can I discuss before you vote? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't get to read in detail your enforcement order. I'm sorry, David. Um, do you specify the types of trees or do you just ask them for a restoration plan consistent with section 24? I just asked for the restoration plan. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. And you know what, we're updating mm -hmm. with the, um, so sorry, Nathaniel, you might want to amend your motion if you all think that the additional trees should be included in the um, in, in the enforcement order. So we'd have to say as as amended or whatever. But um, if if you do want to specify specific trees, then uh, you, you could probably do that. No, I didn't want to. I I did want to order, include the four elm trees because. Um, those weren't supposed to be taken down, though it said they might, but then they needed to comply with Section 24 if that happened, which they didn't. So it should be rolled in, I think. Um, I didn't want to specify types of trees. I wanted to review the restoration plan because, as we all know, elms don't always survive. So maybe we may not want to do kind with kind. So that's all, all I wanted to bring up. I think they were oak, weren't they? Not elm. Well, the the originals were elm. So there's four elm and four oak. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Thanks. it's okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so we have a motion. Uh, so did Nathaniel modify amendment? his motion to? That's what we're asking right now. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, to say, I'm sorry, you lost me there. I was reading what David had written at the same time. You agree to a friendly amendment on your motion? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a, a motion. You have a second. Yeah. Might kill this game. Okay. Here's the list. Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Mike kill this game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Hmm. Okay. Moving on to 88 Coolidge. Um, ADA Coolidge uh, asked to request, um, yeah, at the applicant's request, we are continuing this hearing till May 16th. Can I get a motion? I moved. And a second? Second. I'm going to say that was Mike. I didn't see. Uh, Brian. Mike oh, Brian. All right, great. It's Mike Gildas game. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. That's been continued to the 16th. All right. Here we go. So Thorndike Place. Get everybody in uh, the meeting for Thorndike Place. Um, and David White is recusing himself for the record. Bye, David. See you later. Yep. Yep, so David White's recused himself for this hearing. Um, so um, I'd like to do the thing, these things in the following order, as we've done in the last hearings, the opponent will bring us up to date on their project. And I'm gonna acknowledge uh, the emails that we received. And then I'm going to ask staff for an update if there is one. Uh, then uh, question and comments from the commission and everyone can hear those questions and then ask for comments from the public. I also don't think there will be enough time to finish this discussion tonight. So at the end, if we don't finish, uh, I'm gonna ask the applicant if we could continue this hearing until May 16th. And with that, um, right. Chuck, can I just ask, are we doing stormwater or are we done with? Um... This is, we're done with habitat and habitat. we're okay. doing stormwater. And I think that um, I think that uh, Dominic is here. I see Dominic. Uh, so Dominic, it would be great if you could just uh, bring us up to date with uh, what you've been doing between this meeting and the last meeting that we had. And introduce yourself, please, for the uh, record. Absolutely. Excuse me. Absolutely, uh, Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group, uh, civil engineers, surveyors, land surveyors, well, and scientists for the project. Um, I do have a very brief uh, slideshow, if you would let me share that, that sort of 
the update. Some of it is is reiterating previous things, but um, sure. There we go. Yeah. All right. So again, this is uh, about Thorndike Place, uh, May second, twenty twenty four. Dominic Rinaldi with BSC Group representing the applicants. A uh, quick overview, some of this uh, is you've seen before um, that uh, we firmly believe that the project meets or exceeds all of the standards, stormwater standards set by the Massachusetts Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, infiltration systems were designed by BSC Group based on uh, peer-reviewed test pits um, that were done in May of 2023. Um, peer reviewed in accordance with the requirements of the comprehensive permit for the project. Um, as we discussed at the last public hearing, um, we did we were going to do and have done some additional test pits in the area of the large infiltration system on April 17th. Um, those were also witnessed by a representative of the town's uh, engineering department. Um, and we have continued to monitor the wells that were previously on site as well as the um, additional one that we put on site on that uh, April 17th. Um, and all of these measurements have confirmed what we have previously utilized as our estimated season wide groundwater of elevation four. Um, again, as we have previously stated, we are the, that is a conservative, uh, conservative value. Every value we have seen has been below that. So we picked the highest one we had and, and that continues to be confirmed. Um, we are using conservative infiltration rates. The soils we found on site are a sandy loam, but they are a fine sandy loam. So we're using a lower infiltration rate, uh, making our our systems larger uh, and in order to just a little belt and suspenders protect uh, protect the site in in case you know things function. And we are, using a very conservative NOAA 14 plus plus rainfall, which is uh, required by the Arlington bylaw, although we are not required to comply with the Arlington bylaw, that is significantly larger than um, what is required by the Mass Wildlife Protection Act. And it is larger than what we had previously used during the comprehensive permit process. Um, we performed a mounting analysis showing uh, compliance with standard three. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but we have updated that um, based on some, some discussions in these hearings to for a 24 hour analysis. And again, we believe that this project complies with the Wellness Protection Act in all aspects. I won't go through all of this, but um, basically, you know, peer reviewed test pits in May of 2023. And again, this, you know, a few weeks ago, um, the first round of test pits were witnessed by Whitestone engineers who were hired by the town. And in the last round, they were witnessed by a representative of the town of engineering, uh, the town's engineering staff. Um, in those, um, we observed groundwater and in, in the 2023 test pits, we did observe some, some soil modeling or redox morphic features. Overall now, between the last two years, we have 13 test pits on the site. Um, as well as three from 2020. 2020. Um, you can see on this plan, the brown or the, the three from the 2020, which were done with a different design, which is why we had to go back and do the new ones. Um, the red are the 2023 locations, five in the small infiltration systems, two in the large infiltration system. And this last round, we did five more. Um, for a total of seven in the large infiltration system, put a well in one and then got four out by the uh, out by the corners of the systems. So again, those test pits, you can see on this that uh, these are the, the, the elevations that we've found for, for groundwater over time. Um, and the project is indeed meeting the, at least the minimum two foot separation between the bottom of our infiltration systems and seasonal high groundwater. And that includes the, the new test pits nine through, actually we forgot to put 13 on there, but 13 is the same. Um, again, we have done 
continue to monitor those those wells as requested. Um, this table includes some, you'll see these, these May um, dates are observed groundwater from the original test pits and the April 17th test pit nine is observed groundwater from the test pit. That was the day the well was put in. Um, we have done a couple more rounds of monitoring since April 17th, um, including earlier today. Uh, you can see from these numbers, um, this continues to confirm our seasonal high groundwater of four. Um, one thing we'd like to point out is March 2024 was very wet. Um, it was one of the wettest on record. Um, you can see from these this data from NOAA, um, the precipitation values in March in Massachusetts were massive. So this was a good time for the project, maybe the worst time to do uh, soil test pits and groundwater analysis because it would result in some of the worst values we saw. And again, we did not see anything over four. Um, finally, again, trying to be relatively quick and brief here. Um, we have heard from the commission and, and butters about our groundwater mounting analysis. And although that Previous analysis was peer reviewed by the town's representative during the comprehensive permit process, including our time span. Um, we have gone back and um, revised it to cover a 24 hour period. So I will walk in the next page. I have the results of that, but I will walk you through um, the inputs and, and the input values, uh, how we determine them. So for the recharge rate in order, basically the recharge rate is the rate at which water is applied to the groundwater through the duration of the run of the of the analysis. So to do a 24 hour test, we said, take the required recharge volume, which is what has to be emptied in a 72 hour span so that that required recharge volume is there for the next storm. Take that and what would what is the rate at which is necessary to drain that out of the infiltration system in 24 hours? So that is simply that volume, required recharge volume, which is in cubic feet, divided by the bottom area of that system, which is in square feet, and divided by the time, in this case, one day, so that actually doesn't change it. And you get a rate of 0.2013 feet per day. So that is the recharge rate we used. Specific yield. Uh, we had previously used a higher value. We, we switched to a more conservative value. Um, the higher the value of a specific yield, the lower the groundwater mount you get. So we've actually lowered our specific yield, therefore raising our groundwater mount. Um, that value comes from a, a Department of the Interior uh, paper, 1662D, table 29. Um, this is a very typical value used um, referenced by DEP and others. Uh, we use the average value for silt. Again, I mentioned earlier that we have a sandy loam material, but it's a fine sandy loam. So erring on the side of caution, we're using a silt value. Again, gives you a lower value and therefore a higher amount. For the, high, um, the high, horizontal hydraulic conductivity, um, this is basically the rate water moves sideways. Um, that's often cited in a lot of papers, barring specific test values on a, on a property as 10 times the vertical hydraulic conductivity. Um, the vertical hydraulic conductivity that we've used are the Rawls rates, which are referenced in the stormwater handbook. Um, so again, we are now using the Rawls rate for silt loam, which is lower than the already conservative value we were using in our design. Again, the lower this, horizontal hydraulic conductivity value, the bigger the mound. We were previously using the rate for, the rate we were using in our calcs, which is 0.52 inches per hour, which gives you a 10.4 foot per day. Our horizontal hydraulic conductivity, we are now using a 5.4 foot per day. And the initial, the initial saturated thickness, we have uh, always used this five foot value um, what the initial saturated thickness is, is it's the depth from the top of the groundwater to a confining layer um, around here that's generally either going to be uh, bedrock or uh, if there was a real clay layer down there. And how we pick the five feet is basically from our estimated seasonal high groundwater elevation of four 
to the bottom of our test, to the one of our deepest test pits, um, which is five feet. This is a, a very conservative value. This is uh, initial saturated thickness can have a big impact on groundwater mapping. Um, the bigger the number, the smaller the map. Um, we know um, that there's not a confining layer right under the, our deepest test pit. We're not hitting ledge, we're not hitting play down. But again, we use, have always used this very conservative value uh, because it is the value that we definitively have based on information we've gathered on site. And when you run that for 24 hours in the big system, these are the results you get, a groundwater mound of 1.845 feet, which is less than the two feet separation that we have between seasonal high groundwater. The other inputs just for reference on this are time, which is one day, it's in days. And the two values are half the length and half the width of the large infiltration system, the 98.42 and 20.67 feet. Um, that's where those come from. So you can see we, we've revised the system, we've revised the calc and it still shows compliance with the stormwater standards. So again, to sum up, project meets or exceeds all of the stormwater standards set by the Massachusetts Water Protection Act. Our inf infiltration systems have been designed based on peer-reviewed test pit data. Our test pits were done in last spring in normal groundwater conditions and this spring in what was probably very high groundwater conditions. We are using conservative values for all of our calculations. Um, that is in an effort to give a conservative design, a safe design for this site. And again, that includes our mounting analysis, which has now been up to 24 hour period. Um, so again, we thoroughly believe that all of these uh, standards are met. And with that, I will stop sharing. All right. That is uh, what we've done in the last month. Thank you, uh, Dominic. So with that, um... I know that uh, we don't have our consultant here tonight, so the next step is to turn to the commission. But before I do that, I'm just going to acknowledge that we received 20 plus emails uh, between the two meetings. The majority came in yesterday and today, and so may, I may have that number wrong, but there are a lot of emails about this project. And you can see those uh, all on the Thorndike Place website. And if you're having trouble, you can reach out to David Morgan and he can get you there. So with that being said, uh, I see that David Kaplan has his hand up. David. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Um, and thank you, Dominic, for the presentation. Uh, my question is specific, I guess, to test pits uh, and the groundwater monitoring in seven, eight, and nine, those locations, um, before we had talked about you know, making sure further investigation to ensure the two foot separation uh, between the bottom of the infiltration trench and the um, the groundwater elevation. Um, could you just briefly, I know you went through it in the presentation, can you just briefly again explain it, how you meet that two foot separation? Yeah, so one, one clarification, so test pit eight doesn't have a well, I, I don't know if that's what you meant when you said when you said the monitoring of it. Test pit eight doesn't have a well. Test pit seven and nine do. Um, test pit yeah. eight is in the area of the big infiltration system that was done in 2023. Um, okay. So basically, all of the data we have, so the observed groundwater um, in May of 2023, the observed groundwater a couple of weeks ago in April, and all of the measurements we have taken in the wells, um, any of the wells, but in particular now seven and nine, which are in the area of the large infiltration system, um, have continuously shown uh, groundwater elevations below four. Um, we are using a groundwater elevation of four, um, and the bottom of our infiltration system is set at elevation six, so that we maintain that two foot of separation. Okay. All right, no, thank you for that. Just wanted to clarify the, the data in that section. Thank you. Any, uh, uh, Brian McBride. I guess, excuse me, I guess I have a related question. So there was a lot of controversy last time about uh, well number seven. 
and this, uh, so you, you did a, sort of a repeat uh, nearby of a, t a test pit and a new well. How do you compare the data between those two experiences and what kind of meaning do you give that in terms of how, how that information, which was seemed to be critical last time, um, impacts the, the decision about this project or the, the uh, yeah, how, can you talk about that for a bit? Uh, I mean, so you compare the data, we, we have test bit logs for both, um, and we now have more, obviously more readings um, from the well in test bit seven, because it's been around longer, um, but a few readings for the well in test bit nine over the past few weeks. Um, and we're seeing they're, you know, they're fairly close. Um, test bit nine seems to be skewing a little bit higher than seven in terms of the groundwater um, by, a, you know, a, a matter of a few inches. Um, but they're both um, in the three, you know, let's call it three and a quarter up to just under four um, range. From a soil standpoint, um, you know, we saw a lot of similar soils really throughout the site um, as you work from the western side of the site and move east. Um, you go from a lot of fill that sits over a sandy loam material, a fine sandy loam material, to less fill that sits over a fine sandy loam material. Um, the fill, you know, we generally surprisingly consistent other than some of the miscellaneous debris that's in the fill. Um, it's, again, it, it, the fill itself textures out as a fine sandy loam, um, you know, generally pretty similar in color, so pretty similar in texture. Um, pretty similar in, in stone content. So, I mean, I would say that they're really all the test pits are very similar. Um, when you compare them, you know, all the data we're seeing is is pretty consistent um, and, and points to that groundwater elevation of four being a good number to use. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? I know that we're interested in hearing from everyone tonight and uh, there might be more questions after after uh, we hear from the public a little bit but I, I had a couple questions uh, um, I was wondering if you're going to continue Dominic were you, are you going to continue your monitoring and do you know what date you may stop that monitoring um so I don't know if we have a hard stop date right now um, but we did mention I believe that um, the plan is and, and what we are, are currently under contract for was the the new test pits and then four weeks of monitoring. So it's been two, um, including today. So, um, you know, at least two more weeks. So at the May 16th meeting, you might have some final results of well, what we'll you have saw. Additional numbers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, and each time that you went out and, and checked the test pits, someone from the town was there. Is that, that's correct? I think I heard you say that. Well, no, when we did the test pits, when we performed but, the x-ray of the test pits, they were also. But not, uh, but not when you went to check. Uh, yeah, spot, yeah, okay. Uh, so I, I did make that request before, but it, can you get, uh, give David a call, David Morgan a call and have him get out there the next, couple of times you go out on that site yeah uh how david how much time lead time do you need that would depend on the day i suppose okay. fair, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Mm -hmm. if, if yeah. you're able to give me a couple i mean I've been, I've been trying to go on wednesdays or thursdays because we did the test pits on on wednesday um so you know very supplicant um sure consistent um so i could shoot for the next two wednesday uh actually i think I'm gonna, it's wednesday so it might be i i will call you or, or shoot you an email and, and get good times for you all right very good and just one final question uh i know that the conservation commission they shudder when they hear someone is filled over the wetland and i was just wondering are you allowed to use fill as part of your two feet of separation or is that you know is that not allowed because some projects i, I would presume that the commission would approve a project with uh, a condition that the fill needs to be removed that was placed there in violation 
Well, so first, I, I guess I would say I don't know that I, I don't know if anyone has filled in the wetlands. Um, these test pits obviously aren't in the wetlands. Uh, they're in the uplands. But um, generally speaking, you, you, you know, we'd like to remove the fill um, as much as possible for the infiltration and put um, a similar material that is underneath. So that fine sandy loam material or something that infiltrates at least as fast. Mm -hmm. So, which is so. In fact, you just you will be removing the fill and replacing in the, it with in the infiltration systems, not clean fill, mm -hmm. in other areas. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? I see that Scott Wesley has his hand up. Okay. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to the public, and I'm going to call on Scott Horsley first. Scott, can you just uh, introduce yourself for the record? I sure will, Mr. Chairman. This is Scott Horsley. I'm a hydrologist consultant working for the Arlington Land Trust, and I do have uh, another representative, Dr. Michael Mobile, with me here tonight, who I'll introduce in my brief presentation. And I would like to share my screen just for two or three slides, Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. Sure. David, does he have permission to do that? Sure. Here we go. Uh, are you able to see my first slide here, Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I will just use this to introduce, uh, again, our team. Um, I've already met with you a couple times. Um, tonight we have with us uh, Dr. Mike Mobile, uh, who is a uh, hydrogeologist, McDonald Morrissey. And uh, I'll just introduce him now. I have recommended him for a number of projects in my estimation. Uh, his firm is uh, preeminent in uh, groundwater modeling nationally. I won't go into great details, but I'm sure he'd be happy to share his credentials. Um, Dana Treslow, who's not with us tonight, is a hydrologist with Treslow Consulting and, and was involved in the construction of the monitoring equipment in our monitoring well, which I'd like to briefly describe for you tonight. And I'll go to my next slide. So we did install, and I'm, I think this was a subject matter of a prior meeting, um, we did install two wells um, up along Dorothy Road that are shown here with the blue dots. Uh, and this was in the uh, right away between the road and the property boundary. You may recall uh, at the last meeting we had discussion about the fact that this was there was some opposition by the uh, applicant for us installing these wells, which um, I'm still not sure I understand, but it was legal matters filed. Um, we put the wells in, and I believe, I wasn't there, but um, my client, um, Chris Lake, who's not here tonight with the Arlington Land Trust, told me that there was a site visit, which the Conservation Commission did attend. And uh, my understanding is at that site visit, and, and one of the representatives from the applicant here showed up, and uh, uh, apparently not to, to term, not to see what we were doing, but rather to offer us some suggestion that we may not have the qualifications for this work. And uh, Chris like wanted me to mention a little bit about the difference between the civil engineering profession and hydrology and hydrogeology. I won't get into great detail, but uh, I teach at Tufts University and Harvard. I have many civil engineering students in my classes to take hydrology classes. So I wasn't there, but um, Chris wanted me to mention that that did come up. And I'll just simply say that um, uh, a civil engineer may or may not be qualified to do groundwater work but it's certainly a hydrologist and a hydrogeologist is. And I'd be happy to get into that in great detail <laughs> and at great length if you'd like to later, because I've been qualified in federal and state courts on expert witness work on this exact subject. So I just, so Chris found that disturbing that that question was raised and he wanted me to mention that tonight. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, as you can see from this uh, graphic, these are the prior measurements shown in the test pits uh, by the applicant. Now, uh, Dominic mentioned tonight that his interpretation of the stator is a lot of that they are consistent. Uh, I don't see that. The, I see this as inconsistent. I think I made that uh, remark in two prior meetings. But uh, our, we've been measuring uh, uh, our water levels in our wells that we installed in, in March uh, every 15 minutes with a pressure transducer. We're not going once a week. We're, we have a device in both wells to measure the water levels every 15 minutes. And we have the graphs of that data. We have tabular data. The high water, as Dom Dominique said something interesting tonight, I think, uh, he said that the there was a lot of storms in March nationally. 
he showed a slide saying how wet March was. But I also think I heard him say that they started their measurements in April. Well, we started in March and the, and the water levels in March were very different than April. In fact, they were quite a bit higher. The measurement we got uh, in March was 4.4 feet at this well, which is obviously higher than the four foot elevation we heard about tonight. And you'll notice there's a plus sign associated with the 4.4, because this is a measured water level, not a, an adjusted water level, meaning adjusted by the so-called Frimpter technique uh, to adjust to long-term high water level measurements. And I'll let uh, Dr. Mobile talk about that in just a minute. I'll just show you the last slide. This is our hydrograph from our two wells. Uh, you can see that, uh, in late March, the water levels exceeded his, the four foot level, uh, around 4.3, 4.4 feet. And um, those were measured, not adjusted levels. Uh, in April, you can see that the water levels have, have declined quite a bit. Uh, you may remember, Mr. Chairman, I strongly recommend the applicant get out there early because they might miss the high water levels. I think they've done that, Mr. Chairman. I think they missed them. So I think what they're measuring now are not the peak water levels, but the peak level water levels were in March. We measured them. We have the data. Here it is. Uh, so I'll stop there. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mobile at this point um, and have him present. He did submit a comment letter on the mm. project. And uh, if I may, I'll turn over to him and we could, perhaps we can both take questions if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, just. Let me get uh, the commission back involved. Uh, we have um, a new presenter, Dr. Mobile. Uh, he has some slides. He'd like to discuss this some more. Does everyone agree with that on the commission? I'm hearing yes. So please allow Dr. Mobile to take over. Thank you. Uh, do I have permission to share? Seems that I do. Excellent. Thank you. Yep, we see that. Okay. Verify here. Yes, great. Okay, well, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and, uh, and Commission members. My name is Michael Mobile, um, the president of McDonald Morrissey Associates uh, mm -hmm. by MMA. Um, and I'm appearing uh, this evening, as Scott indicated, at the uh, request of the Arlington Land Trust. Um, so just to, to run through my credentials uh, very quickly, since I haven't presented before, um, I do hold three degrees, including a doctorate in civil engineering from Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech. Um, also a certified groundwater professional through uh, NGWA, National Groundwater Association. Um, I have uh, actually at this point more than 20 years of professional uh, experience as a quantitative hydrogeologist. Um, and over that period, I've specialized in analytical and numerical modeling techniques uh, of groundwater and integrated groundwater and surface water systems. Um, so in addition to doing a lot of modeling work ourselves, MMA also routinely reviews modeling work done by others. Uh, and that's exactly what we were asked to do here relative to the applicant's um, groundwater mounting analysis, which indeed at its heart is an analytical modeling effort. Um, and so that's the subject of these slides. Uh, for reference, I'll point you to uh, my latest letter, which is indicated at the bottom of this slide, uh, material I'm covering in the slides tonight generally matches the content of that letter. Not progressing. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so to promote efficiency here, I'm just going to skip right to kind of the, the primary issue that we found in our review, and that's how BSC interpreted the, the Mass Stormwater Handbook, uh, and, and in particular how it pertains uh, or how the language pertains to conducting groundwater mounting analyses. So you can see a, an excerpt here on the on the slide. The highlighted gray section is where you want to pay attention. Um, you can see the, the required recharge volume term is indeed mentioned in that section. It's in italics. Um, and that, that term certainly does have a very specific definition in the, in the handbook. I'm not, not denying that in any way. But what this section does not say is to do what BSC has done, which is to, to predict the mounting height that would be created by steadily infiltrating the required recharge volume. Instead, if you read through the remainder of the, the handbook, it's abundantly clear that this term's simply being used to generally refer to the infiltration basin or infiltration structure storage, which can be in some instances equal to that required recharge volume. And that's clearly suggested right here by the parenthetical that follows required recharge volume, infiltration basin storage. Not that it's super necessary, but I'll bring up some quotes from elsewhere in the handbook that make it very clear. You can see the highlighted or, or 
bolded sections. The, the idea here is not the specific re required recharge volume. It's that the basins need to drain fully and they need to drain fully and be proven to do so under storm events. You can see that in the second quote, totally exfiltrate. Uh, and you're, you're really looking to understand is groundwater mon uh, mounding going to prevent the structure from draining fully within the, a 72 hour period. So if you compare BSC's approach, and I will note what Dominic just presented isn't a, isn't a change to this. They're still using the required recharge volume. They're just doing it over a longer period of time. It's the same thing. So if, if we compare the two ideas here, BSC is simply looking at an artificial event that would singular, singularly result in the amount of infiltration that's equal to or a volume of infiltration that's equal to the required recharge volume. Whereas the, the handbook, it's, it's seeking a more informative analysis to estimate groundwater mounding created by th these design storm events that have been looked at by the applicant's own hydrocat model. And to see if in those cases, uh, are there indications that the system may not drain within that 72 hour time frame due to groundwater mounding. So this, this will come off blunt and, and I'm not, intending to embarrass or offend in any way, but this is absolutely a clear and consequential misinterpretation that, that must be addressed, okay? So to, to get to why at a greater level of detail, um, it's, it's important to understand, at least at a conceptual level, what's being contemplated by the mounting analysis that BSC has conducted. And I'm gonna show some graphics. They're not intended to be a perfect representation of, of the systems in question. They're just intended to get the, the concept across, okay? Across. So. What we're looking at is really a cross section vertically in, in the ground. You can see where land surface is. You can see this you know, simple representation of a subsurface infiltration structure, and you can see where the water table is before any infiltration occurs. Okay, so a storm comes along, runoff is collected, it's routed to this system. Uh, as the water starts to get into the system, you have infiltration occurring through the bottom of, of the, the system. That's that infiltration function that we've talked about. If the infiltration rate, or excuse me, if the, the inflow rate gets high enough and the, the rate is exceeding the ability of the system to infiltrate or the infiltration rate, then you can get a water level rise internally and that starts to occupy some of that internal storage volume that's available in the system, okay? Now the infiltration proceeds down through the unsaturated zone, creates a wetting front. And when that gets down to the water table, um, if the rate of infiltration reaching the water table, which is called recharge, that exceeds the uh, shallow aquifer's ability to dissipate, excuse me, dissipate pressure laterally, then the water table begins to rise and mount. And that's what this graphic show. Okay, and the, the height of that resultant mound depends on a variety of factors, many of which pertain to the, the nature and the, the characteristics of the shallow aquifer, but, but the rate and duration of the infiltration that go into the mounding model strongly influence the, the magnitude of mounding. And that's that's really where this, this misinterpretation uh, represents a, a really critical defect in the mounting analysis. Rather than evaluating the mounting produced by design storm events that have, have already been evaluated by Hydro HydroCAD, and they have an idea of what that infiltration is, uh, BSC is creating an artificial event, as I said before, that, that produces that volume that's equal to the required recharge volume. Then they predict the time that it would take for that volume to infiltrate. Now they're using 24 hours. Before they were using, what, 1.22 hours? Um, under the assumption of no adverse impacts from groundwater mounting, and so you can you can see what they what they were using previously at least. Okay, so that that volume is on the order of 1,100 uh, cubic feet, and they were using previously 1.22 hours. Now, the significant problem with that approach is, according to their own HydroCAD model, the design storm events that they've looked at produce significantly greater volumes of infiltration that require much, much longer durations compared to this uh, required recharge volume-based approach, even, even assuming no mounting impact. So if we look at the, the two-year events, that's a, a 50%, statistically, that's a 50% chance in any given year that you get an event like this. Um, you see that the, the volume that HydroCAD is predicting that would infiltrate is on the order of 14 times that of the, the required recharge volume, and it takes more than 38 times the duration to get that water into the ground assuming no groundwater mounting impacts. If you look at the 100 year event, so now we're 1% chance in a given year, it's 16 and a half times the volume and, and almost 45 times the duration. So clearly these design storms are just a completely, completely different animal. Um, okay, so we, we saw the, 
the simple conceptual diagram in an ideal case where the mounting stays below the bottom, what happens if it, it does rise up and hit, hit the bottom of the system? Well, now we can look at the right-hand diagram. It's the same basic behavior uh, up to this point, now you, but now you've got mounting, more severe mounting rising up to the bottom, okay? At that point, the gravity-driven free drainage condition uh, is disrupted and infiltration rates start to be reduced. It's not a binary condition. It's not like you're flipping the infiltration switch off and it stops, but rates are impacted. And the reductions to the infiltration rates can be very significant when mounting is extensive. Um, so now, um, if the water coming in, the, the volume, or the, excuse me, the, the rate of the inflow to the system remains the same, but the infiltration rate at the bottom of the system has been compromised to some degree, uh, there has to be a balancing response in the system. And, and one uh, possibility is that the outflow, as this diagram shows, the outflow simply increases to, to handle that uh, reduction in infiltration. You know, the system could also back up, I suppose, but, but this is the kind of uh, conceptually typical uh, response, right? And just to kind of summarize the implications of this type of condition, um, you know, I think the big thing is if you perform a groundwater mounting analysis, you see the mound rise to the bottom, that's, that's invalidating the assumption that you have a constant infiltration rate. And that's intrinsic to BSC's hydrocat analysis. That is assumed throughout their calculations that are done. Uh, and that extends to, as I, I show in the second point here, uh, if, if the infiltration rate is being reduced and that does constitute a, a change to the primary outflow, well, that, that would impact the rate control predictions that are being used uh, to, to demonstrate compliance with, or attempt to demonstrate compliance with stormwater standard too. Um, there's also the impact on drainage. Time. So reduced infiltration rates mean extended drainage times. Everything that's been looked at thus far has assumed no impacts from groundwater mounting, but uh, you have to drain within 72 hours. And if that, that infiltration rate is reduced, it's going to take longer. Okay. Now, just a, a quick comment on what do you do in this situation? Well, it's, it's incredibly difficult, admittedly. If you have a, a design where you see groundwater mounting rising to the bottom of the system, trying to develop an analysis that accounts for that reduction and, and you know, migrates it through back through HydroCAD and, and there's a, 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 a link between your mounting predictions and the, the routing calculations, that's, that's very difficult to do. Um, and that's one clear reason that you, it's very common to see systems just designed so that the mounting doesn't rise to the bottom or they're raised such that the bottom is above the mounting prediction during storm events. Okay, so just to be clear, what I'm saying about groundwater mounting impacting infiltration rates and adversely affecting uh, infiltration systems is not my own speculation. If there's any uh, thought of that. Uh, there's a clear scientific consensus on this issue. Uh, it's reflected in guidance documents issued by state and federal agencies throughout peer reviewed literature. Uh, and, and I've just provided a, a few examples here. Um, see the USGS at the top, EPA, New Jersey DEP, and a, a guidance document for, uh, for Washington State DOT. Um, I, could, I could create a even longer list from peer reviewed literature. Um, it's, I think it's interesting to note that the top quote here from the USGS, that actually comes from the, the, the very study that produced the specific spreadsheet that BSC is using to conduct their, their modeling analysis. Uh, and, and I'm not saying they're disagreeing here. It's actually clear, quite clear from their stormwater report that they understand the issue. So the highlighted section here says a mounting analysis has been performed in accordance with the, the Hantouche method. That's the analytical model they're using that, that's implemented in the USGS spreadsheet to ensure that a groundwater mound does not extend into the bottom of the infiltration system, preventing infiltration. And then they use of the required recharge volume, which as I've already said, that's inappropriately narrow for the reasons, uh, reasons I mentioned. Uh, so just to, to bring this all together before I go to the next slide, to repeat statements shown above in the stormwater report, clearly shows that BSC understands that groundwater mounting can impact infiltration rates. Scientific consensus is the general indication, and, and they seem to agree uh, that, or the general indicator is that if groundwater levels rise to the bottom of the system, that's the, the indicator that's uh, going to signify rate reductions. Uh, and that's uh, really what needs to be reacted to if you, you see that prediction. Okay, so the, the plot here shows the maximum predicted uh, groundwater mounting height on the y-axis. 
uh, this would be at the, the centroid or the, the spatial center of the rectangular area in question. So the, the biggest infiltration area on site that's proposed. And you can see BSC's result. This is their previous result. Uh, it's gotten larger uh, since uh, with their 24-hour their analysis, as they call it. Um, but that's about 0.4 feet. That's where they were before. You can see um, that that stays below the approximate bottom of the system there. And that's according to BSC's suggested estimated seasonal high ground order. They've got two feet of separation. So that red line's at two feet of separation. Now, here are the peak mounting predictions just using BSC's own model, their own inputs for this system, along with increased infiltration durations representative of the, the storm, uh, storm events, design storm events that they've analyzed with HydroCAD. And, and this is assuming no adverse impacts from groundwater mounting at this point. Okay, so the the infiltration durations for these events, the two year events, uh, 47 hours approximately, uh, and the 100 year event is upwards of 55 hours. So just to be clear on the issue here, BSC's analysis suggests this system will require multiple days to drain, assuming no impacts from groundwater mounting. But then their groundwater mount model clearly suggests adverse effect uh, adverse effects under these events, you know, namely significantly reduced infiltration rates. Um, and you could actually adjust that model and, and uh, adjust the duration to see how quickly the groundwater mound will rise to the bottom of the system according to their model. And that's, that's after just six hours, okay? So the, these systems are, per BSC's design, designed to drain under these major storm events over multiple days, but the mounting impacts are going to occur after just six hours. So that, that leaves the hanging questions of how long will it take for the system to drain during storm events in consideration of the adverse mounting effects? Will, will it take more than 72 hours? I, I think that's highly likely, given what we're seeing here. I, I'll openly acknowledge I haven't done like a detailed analysis to support that, but just based on the, the magnitude of mounting here and the fact that Without any groundwater mounting impacts considered, it's multiple days. That's that's a problem. And the the other question is, how would the reduced infiltration rates impact the calculations that are being done with HydroCAD to evaluate compliance with stormwater standards? And so on that, just a, a quick look uh, at the diagram in the uh, stormwater report, you can see that this system, essentially the, the overflow goes right to the wetlands. <clears throat> um, if we pop up the table from the stormwater report, that pertains to this location, uh, this 1L location to the wetland uh, at which rate control is being evaluated, um, it's pretty important to recognize that at the two-year event, it's basically no room for a rate increase. So, you know, any translation of reduced infiltration rates to increased overflow rates is, is going to represent a violation for this storm. Um, but, you know, I'll acknowledge I'm a hydro hydrogeologist, hydrologist, modeling specialist, I'm not a stormwater design engineer, but my concern in looking at this would extend to the system performance under more common events. Okay, you've got tremendous mounding indicated for the two-year event, strongly suggests mounding issues for more frequent events than the two-year event. That's a 50% chance in any year. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a super uncommon condition. Uh, and then you've got a trend here. If you look at the, the differences in these numbers, they're getting closer and closer pre-development and post-development as the event probability goes up. So it's a trend toward kind of a poorer rate control capability under more frequent events. That looks like a particularly bad combination to me. Uh, it's a little beside the point, but, but I wanted to point that out because it's quite concerning. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, <clears throat> quite clear that the applicant's mounting analysis is meaningfully, meaningfully flawed. Um, those flaws flow through to other calculations that are being relied upon uh, by the applicant here to claim compliance with the stormwater standards and the, and the stormwater handbook. Um, you know, as shown by my slides, uh, the most significant issue is this misinterpretation of the handbook uh, that leads to this uh, erroneous re uh, required recharge volume based scenario. Uh, it seems to still apply, right? Because they're, they're now just using the same volume over 24 hours. Um, as I note here, my experience, common practice, is to use the largest event, storm event, for which rate control is proposed. And uh, in this case, that'd be the 100-year, 24-hour storm event. Uh, 
that's the primary issue. I, I did identify some other issues in my review. Uh, Dominic's presentation actually did provide a little, a little bit of clarification on some of these. Uh, some more questions did arise that I won't get into at this point. Um, but I, I do want to mention one big thing here. Um, the, the first bullet here, the appropriateness and applicability of the Hantouche model versus a, a, an improved representation. I, I mentioned mod flow here. So it's important to understand this Hantouche, Hantouche analytical model is, is a highly simplified uh, uh, model of groundwater flow. It has a, a number of simplifying assumptions that hardly ever really apply to, to any site. Things like an infinite aquifer extent, completely homogeneous material, no, no property differences, uh, isotropic, meaning there's no property differences between uh, or, or ratios horizontal to vertical. Um, but a, a big one that applies here is that this model assumes that there are no barriers under this infinite aquifer extent assumption. There are no barriers to horizontal uh, groundwater flow, okay? Uh, if a barrier does exist, uh, that's going to exacerbate the, the, well, if you were to really represent that barrier, uh, it would have a reflective behavior on the mounding and would increase the mounding uh, at the, the location of, of the uh, infiltration. And, and so in this case, it's my understanding that we've got waterproof foundations that are, are pretty darn close to many of these systems. So uh, you know, I, I think it's important to justify the use of that model in conditions that are particularly uh, inappropriate for the use of that modeling technique. In my mind, uh, a model like ModFlow that's uh, numerical and can handle the presence of, of barriers like that is, is the right way to go here. Um, so I, I, I was initially going to stop there. I have one more slide. <laughs> I sorry, I'm sorry for taking so much time, but since the, the estimated seasonal high groundwater condition has come up today, um, I didn't intend to, to present on that, but I wanted to provide just this one quick look at, um, at groundwater conditions. So what I'm showing here is the water level record, da daily water levels at a USGS index well uh, in Lexington, Mass. So it's not too far away. The applicants used this well before to conduct a, a frimter analysis. And I, I have a letter on that uh, that I've submitted as well. Um, but it, it's pretty well correlated to the site. So when water level changes occur at this well, uh, they're, they're pretty well correlated with water level changes at the site. Um, and that's that's been corroborated by looking at the, the data that Scott Horsley showed before. Um, what I've, I've plotted here in the, the colorful lines here are the, the dates on which uh, BSC is claiming they've, they've taken water level measurements from the new wells. Um, you can see the, the trends that occurred. Based, this is just going back to, to January 1st of this year and out through uh, May 1st. You can see the dates that they were, were measuring water levels at the wells certainly don't correspond to the peak water level conditions. The first date is, is you know, a, a relatively, uh, you know, it's an elevated water condition to some degree, but it's certainly not corresponding to, to peak measurements. Um, and so in, in my mind, what, what BSC was asked to do before, and they did to account for not being there on the days of high groundwater was to conduct a, a frimter analysis that, that adjusts the measured water levels as, as Scott Horsley described before. So, um, I, I guess what I would ask is why hasn't that printer analysis been performed again with their new water level measurements? Um, I think Scott, as Scott showed, uh, you know, the, the 15 minute uh, resolution data that's been collected just off site is, is showing higher groundwater level conditions. So uh, it, it certainly suggests there's a need for additional adjustment here that, that hasn't been performed. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm sorry for taking so much time, but uh, but thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, can you take the screen down? Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, David Morgan, uh, so I just wanna, before I let David Morgan, uh, sorry, David Kaplan, before I let David Kaplan speak, I just wanna let everyone know that we've been at this for almost 50 minutes right now. So I anticipated about an hour's worth of discussion. So keep that in mind, uh, David Kaplan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was hoping to understand the peak elevations uh, for the mounding analysis that the gentleman just presented. Would you mind putting the slide deck back up and go to the slide that shows the peak mounding elevations? Thanks. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry, here we go. I think there it is. Is this one you're All talking right. about? Yeah, yeah. And are these what what's the elevation datum on the on the y-axis there? Yeah, so this is mounding above the starting groundwater elevation. So the assumption is this is effectively the the water level change that would be created by infiltration on top of the estimated seasonal high groundwater level. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if the groundwater uh elevation is four, then I guess it would be about 10 would be the max for ultimate. Yeah, no, no one thing. I'm sorry. Because I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the site plan and, you know, I'm seeing elevations of 11 and 10. And, you know, I'm just, you know, is this an artesian condition? Are we having groundwater coming out of the ground? It's just, yeah, it seems no, like, it seems like a lot. It, it's a great question. And, uh, and I didn't get into, again, the, the, some of the limitations of the model that's being employed here. So the one of the assumptions in the model is that effectively the infinite or the the aquifer has an infinite vertical extent too. Okay, so these aren't aren't realistic uh, mounting heights. The the system could never infiltrate water to the point of driving groundwater up to this elevation. Really, what these bars that get well above the bottom or well above that dashed red line represent is more of a a generic indication of of major impacts to stormwater infiltration. They don't represent a real kind of post development storm uh, equilibrated groundwater level that's been created by infiltration. Does that make sense? All right. Yeah, it 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 does. It it muddies the waters a little bit for me. I mean, I'm looking for you know we're looking to analyze this on sort of a real groundwater elevation, what what it's going to be and uh, what it's predicted to be and and any differences that you and Mr. Horsley have with what BSC has presented. So I'm having a tough time yeah. uh, defining that, you know, with, with these, with these graphics, it seems like a, a, a present, a generic presentation on, you know, what potential differences are, but, you know, we need, we need to look at sort of real differences and numerical differences. And it, it it's, it's hard to make that decision when, we're presented with a lot of information that doesn't necessarily compare apples to apples. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And I, I think that gets to the point that I, I mentioned before that trying to conduct a, a mounting analysis or a, an overall analysis that accounts for this type of condition where groundwater mounting is a, a major impact on infiltration that requires having models that talk to one another. So having the groundwater mounting analysis inform the hydrocad analysis and vice versa. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. So typically, and, and I, I could uh, direct you to the New Jersey uh, DEP's guidance on mounting analysis. It's very clear on this. Typically, the response is you adjust your design to avoid that impact. You raise the system, you change the infiltration footprint so you're not creating such a large mound. Um, because and again, part of the reason for that is the the analysis to to try to predict what would occur in this adverse interaction scenario is, is very very complicated. Yeah. Uh, sure. So, David uh, Kaplan, are you finished? Um... Yeah, no, I'm just I'm I'm just trying to to piece through it to see. You know, I mean, I would I would like to hear. I guess a rebuttal from from BSC, and I would like mm -hmm. you know again they presented I think pretty clearly that you know with their analysis as you know as, as some people may have some issues with it they've looked at modeling they've looked at groundwater elevations and I'm seeing a two foot separation so I'm not really seeing. Uh, any any additional information that we need to to consider. Um, so again, I'm, I guess I'm just not a hundred percent convinced that you know this information is, is you know should give us any additional pause that this project isn't meeting the the standards. I, I, I would I would just respond to that, Mr. Kaplan, with. The, the clear evidence uh, that BSC's own report identifies the fact that if groundwater mounding 
reaches the bottom of their infiltration system, it's a problem. If you run their own mounting analysis for these storm events, it predicts groundwater mounting reaching the bottoms of the system. Right, and my, my understanding is that groundwater mounting for the, the purposes of the analysis is that it just can't breach the infill. It, it can't, I guess, what was it? Like over top, I mean, it's, it's not if it if it comes into the, but it, if it if it breaches and overflows the system, I thought that's the standard that we're looking for here. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just respond to Mr. Kaplan's question, which is a good one. Uh, uh, hold that. hold on a second, there, Scott. I'm sorry. So, David, uh, do you want to hear from uh, Dominic, or do you want to let uh, Scott tie tie into uh, the doctor's uh, comments? Um, I, I I see Dominic has his hand up. I would I would like to hear from him first, if that's possible. That is Dominic, please. Uh... Sure. So a few things. Um, one, I'd like to make a few clarifications between the the two presentations. Um, in Scott Horsley's presentation, um, where he referenced things not being consistent, he went back. The only thing, the only piece of data he showed you was the observed groundwater from the May test pits, not the measured groundwater that we have performed over the last few months, which I would say are very consistent um, as we have presented to you showing ranges, you know, earlier in the in the year in the twos and, and into the threes and, and even the high threes um, it, during the month of, of April. Um, second, um, one of the major points I'd like to make here is um, that last presentation really it, it mashed together. I, I would respectfully disagree um, and believe that uh, Mr. Is it Mo, I want to pronounce the name right. Mobile. Is it Mobile? I'm sorry. I don't. Dr. Mobile. Dr. Mobile. Uh, as as he said, I would respectfully disagree with his interpretation of the regulations. Um, the required recharge volume is a very clearly defined uh, item in the stormwater handbook. It is very clearly defined in multiple places. Um, the groundwater mounting analysis is about standard three. It has nothing to do with standard th two, which is where you're talking about your two, 10 and 100 year storm events. It is about maintaining the entirety of standard three is to ensure that your post-development site, after you build something, you still have the same amount of infiltration of groundwater as you do prior to building that thing. And as part of that, what it requires is that that required recharge volume disappears. It goes into the ground. So that storage is there for the next storm to provide the required recharge volume. That is how DEP has enforced it every time we have ever seen it. Um, that is how we would expect DEP to enforce it again. Um, it is about the required recharge volume. Again, a very clearly defined item in this. As far as the, the Hintush method goes, um, it is the only method that's specifically referenced in the handbook. It is the standard practice in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do these groundwater mounting analysis under the stormwater management standards. Yes, there are other, uh, there are, there's other software. Um, but that is the standard one that is used. Um, that is why we used it and not some other one. Um, the representations of, of groundwater shooting through the ground, the, you know, Dr. Mobilite, it, Mobilite, sorry, I apologize, I'm butchering your last name. Um, my mouth is very dry tonight. Um, are, they're representing storm events that you don't have to do the, do the groundwater mounting analysis on. And what you would find is every site you'd have that. One thing to keep in mind is these met this method doesn't it doesn't know what your groundwater separation is, right? So whether you have two feet or twenty feet of groundwater separation, if you run that model in that way, you will get the same result. So what they're what he's implying is if you had four feet of groundwater separation, you wouldn't even have to do this analysis but you'd still have the same result, which would mean that basically I would almost defy you to find stormwater systems in the state that work according to that. Um, this is this, again, the standard practice. Um, I, I 
disagree with their interpretation of the stormwater handbook. Um, the required recharge volume is what's at play here because this is for standard three. Standard three doesn't say you have to recharge, you know, the two-year storm or the hundred-year storm. It is a very specific volume. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, so uh, I know Nathaniel and Susan, you have your hand up. Would you like to hear from uh, Scott Horsley prior to taking your comments or Nathaniel, you were next. Just unmute if you feel like you should speak now. Thanks. I had slightly different topics. So I guess if Scott had something to say on this topic before we move on. Um, okay. It would be helpful to hear from him briefly, but yeah, I guess I have related questions, but I yes, I'm happy to hear from Scott briefly. Thanks. I agree. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman. So um, Commissioner Kaplan raised a good question about reality versus theoretical. And just to kind of reiterate what uh, Mike Mobile was saying, and perhaps it wasn't totally clear, using the required storm event is theoretical because in fact, and you can ask him this question to make sure, they're not proposing to infiltrate only the required storm event. They're proposing to infiltrate a much larger event. And what we are saying is the model should predict, as Mr. Commissioner Kaplan is suggesting, what is really going to happen? So I guess the question is, and I could be wrong. I don't think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm not. The proposal here is not to infiltrate the required storm event, it's, which is a small one. They are exceeding it tremendously. And what we're saying is the groundwater model should reflect, to Commissioner Kaplan's point, the reality, the real storm event that's being infiltrated. That's the difference. All right, thank you. Uh, Nathaniel? Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say, as a basic matter, it sounds like Dominic updated his mounting analysis, presented those results this evening. I didn't see in the materials that we'd actually received, you know, I guess, the more detailed report, the updated portion of the stormwater report that did that. So I'm concerned that uh, Dr. Mobile was referring to an earlier version of the stormwater report. So I just want to make sure that we're, ta we're, yeah, we're, we're talking about the most recent mm. mounting analysis, because I'm I'm not convinced just to look at the date. His, his letter is dated the 26th of April, and it's referring to a stormwater report. Uh, let's see. Uh, stormwater report maybe even revised August 21st. So I guess it would be helpful for the next meeting just for him to revise the letter, his comment letter to reflect whatever Dominic was speaking, the mounting analysis that Dominic was speaking about tonight. Because I, I mean, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me that maybe we weren't even talking about the, we were getting a review and critique on the on an earlier version of the stormwater report. Or the mounting analysis. Sorry, if if I may clarify that, yeah, that that mounting analysis is new, so they they probably haven't seen it yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I guess that'd be my request. Um, and I sort of somewhat shared David Kaplan's comment about it'd be nice to present if Dr. Noble is going to present another letter to present it sort of in the in the same way that BSC presented it, so we can relate it to the site. It, just I, I had trouble relating that graph to the way that BSC and everyone else has been talking about the groundwater on the site. I mean, the graph just to me seemed just upside down, or maybe I wasn't understanding it. Um, also, I'm wondering if he looked for he mentioned guidances uh, on uh, groundwater mounting effects. He cited uh, he listed on his slides, which I which would be great to get a copy of the slides. Um, documents guidance from EPA, New Jersey DEP. I'm just wondering, did he look at DEP, Mass DEP, to see if there's any guidance on that? And even if it doesn't relate to the stormwater handbook, I can't remember if mounting analyses are used in other DEP programs uh, in the state. So it'd be helpful to get, uh, to see, to tell us if there's any other guidance on that. Um, and I was gonna say short of, if there's not, and not to put uh, Attorney Stephanie Kiefer on the spot, but if she knows of any DEP decisions, which talks about, you know, how to do this analysis, you know, is the, I guess the, the term here that's being used is the 
required recharge volume if there if there's been any DEP adjudicatory hearing decisions by administrative law judges about you know what exactly that is and <laughs> it would be helpful if they're to have the applicants if they'd like to to respond um, on that uh, on that point so um sorry several points there so happy to clarify uh, any requests if I, I'm babbling but that's all I had at this point. Sure, I see Stephanie uh, Kiefer has her hand up. Uh, so why don't you jump in right now and thanks. Through the, through the chair, uh, Nathaniel, um, I, I'm happy to, um, I, I hadn't seen obviously this um, or had an opportunity to review the presentation in full this evening, um, uh, Dr. Mobiles. Uh, I will, um, um, in turn, I will I will go back and look and I will provide a response to the commission and, and to your specific question on that. Thanks. I'm happy to do that. I don't have the answer this evening, but um, no, very happy I didn't to. suspect you would, but yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Brian McBride. Yeah, so I maybe this is the same question, but uh, I don't believe that Hat identified a misinterpretation of the Stormwater Handbook in their review of BSC's earlier work. And so it'd be, it'd be interesting if uh, Scott Horsley is able to present exactly where they see the flaw so that Hatch has a chance to chime in on this too, as our sort of hired uh, third party reviewer, I think they would have an important voice in that question. And then maybe just a quick question for Scott or, or for Mike, um, does the additional data from BSC's new test wells, especially number seven, give you confidence that those numbers are reasonable? Last, last time, you felt those were there was a problem with the redox levels and those that data wasn't reliable. Does the new information make you feel more comfortable that that um, those numbers are probably acceptable? Well, I can I can respond to that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the prior there was a value previously that had a you may recall a minus C level value, which I think I went on record several times didn't make any sense to me. Never seen it. Uh, so the fact that they're above sea level certainly makes it more believable. But I think the most important point, and I tried to make this earlier, is the measurement in April, as I think Dominique presented well tonight, did not measure what he suggested was a wetter time in March. And our well shows that the, it, it agrees with Dominique's point that March was much wetter than April, and that would be much more representative. They didn't get their wells in in time. So... If your question is, does the more me recent measurements from BSC provide a good estimate of seasonal high water, I would say no, they they missed it. It was March. And again, uh, the, the, on top of that, you need to add the Frimpter adjustment. So I guess that would imply that an applicant in that situation would have to constantly monitor the groundwater level for the whole, for a very long period to capture the wettest, wettest day or wettest days. Ide ideally, that's true, but the Frimpter analysis allows you to adjust a water level measurement pretty much from any time of the year. So one option is we could look at, the, or Dominique could add the Frimpter adjustment to his measurements in April and May and see where that goes. But uh, as uh, the hydrograph that Dr. Mobile showed, um, those dates of measurement clearly are not the high water level times. Okay, so... We've gone over an hour on this. I'm going to let Dominic and Dr. Mobile um, say their piece. But then I think there's a lot here, a lot to think about. I would ask the slides get um, then anything that was presented tonight, if we don't already have it at the conservation meeting to uh, conservation office, if you could send them to David. Um, and then after Dominic and Dr. Mobile talk, we will go over what the commission would like uh, at the last meeting, and then we'll ask for a continuance. So Dominic, just uh, add to your comments if you will allow us to continue this hearing and please start. Um, yes, I'll start with that. Yes, um, yes, we will uh, allow to continue the next hearing. Um, so a couple of things. One, um, I'd like to point out that we have uh, readings on March 15th and another one on April 1st. So. We, the, the implication that we somehow wildly missed March is uh, very misleading. Um, secondly, um, and we can get into this in, in more detail um, later as I, I know you want to uh, sort of wrap things up tonight, 
but um, and we will present this information to you. Um, I found it interesting that Mr. Horsley just requested a frontier analysis when um, in a case from Nantucket uh, in 2012, Shwakimo Ducklands versus Nantucket Planning Board. Um, Mr. Horsley was a witness in that case and testified and agreed with another witness that um, Frimter method wasn't required for, um, for a system where groundwater was observed during the spring, where they had multiple groundwater uh, observations during the spring, which is what we have here. Um, so I would stay. I would agree with Mr. Horsley's analysis from that case um, that a frimter analysis isn't necessary. We have numerous groundwater measurements. We're gonna get more, uh, as I told uh, Susan earlier. I, I actually, Chuck, I think it was you, I apologize, um, who asked if we were gonna continue to do this, um, and we will. And um, as I said before, all of the data continues to point towards that number of four working. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Michael Mobile. Yes, thank you. Just one one last comment. Um, when I I will send my slides. I sent them before, but I'll send an updated set that includes the, the last slide that I showed. Uh, when I send them, please look carefully at that slide that shows the quotes uh, from the stormwater handbook, because the the section that Mr. Rinaldi is focusing on, it, it, there's a singular mention of required recharge volume, and then there's a parenthetical right after that that clarifies that. It's talking also about the, the basin storage, as I showed with my, my graphics. And then I provide numerous other quotes from elsewhere in the handbook that state that the, the systems need to be designed to fully drain during storm events. So that's what I'm, it's one of the main points of my slides is that using the applicant's own modeling approach, it clearly shows mounting rising up to the bottoms of the systems and that has not been evaluated, has not been demonstrated that these systems will, will drain in accordance with the handbook. So just, just please pay particular attention to those quotes because they are directly from the stormwater handbook. I would also invite you to call DEP and ask this question. How do you, how do you perform these mounting analyses? Because the, the answer is there isn't much guidance out there uh, that, that's really clear on how to do this, but, but they know. Okay, and thanks uh, for everyone on their really good presentations and um, on to the commission at this point. So I would like to continue. I see uh, Steph Stephanie has her hand up. Oh, sorry, sorry, Stephanie, didn't no, see that. No worries, thank you. Um, I, I think that there's there's been a lot of back and forth going on this evening and um, obviously the applicant has BSC and the opponents to the project have hired Mr. Horsley and Dr. Um, uh, Mobile on this. Um, and I think it's one of the things I found a little bit, you know, confusing for the commission and for the other people here is that their presentation this evening um, listed it as a peer review. It's, it's really not a peer review. It's a review by an opposition group and we should be mindful of that. Um, and I think that continually asking an opposition group if they agree with something, the answer tends to always be no, because they're an opposition group. So there's a simple process here. We can go back and have an independent peer review, an engineer licensed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, look at the updated information um, that doesn't have an agenda, that is simply doing a third party peer review. Um, so I, I think, because what's gonna happen is there's gonna be continually back and forth between an opposition group's paid experts and the applicant's experts. So I'm just trying to um, get through a, a process that is fair and that is done by a qualified Massachusetts professional to apply the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Thank you. If, sure. if, that, if that's an offer of, of the applicant to uh, fund a peer reviewer, I guess I would be in favor of that. And, and I was I that was one one uh, comment I was going to make. We are out of money for our peer reviewer. Um, and given this back and forth tonight, Miss um, Kiefer, I totally agree with you. I think 
we need a third party peer review to help us get through this because I, for one, I'm a scientist, but I am not a hydrogeologist or a civil engineer. And, and some of this is way over my head, so. In that vein, the, the commission had previously used Hatch. Um, um, I'm not quite certain why the, the prior peer reviewer who was doing work wasn't Massachusetts licensed, but Hatch does have Massachusetts civil engineers that I, I think you've already given them a proposal that if, and I, I think that the time frame could be very fast, um, that wouldn't require more delay. We've, we've been at this process for months um, and we have continually in good faith come back and um, presented our positions, updated, provided additional information. Um, so, and, and if, if I'm over speaking for the applicant themselves, they should cut me off right now. I would agree. And I think if we go back to Hatch, we would have to narrow down their prior scope of work and just really focus on the stormwater handbook in Massachusetts. And I agree that I think we need to be explicit about we need a Massachusetts PE on this. I'm, I'm not sure that the person who presented was, maybe they had input from someone from Massachusetts, but we need someone from Hatch who has is it Massachusetts PE with experience in the stormwater standards? Okay. So, yeah, so we're, I, I think we've been, we've got an offer to uh, re-engage with Hatch for a third party review. That's peer review. Peer review. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a motion from the commission to uh, engage or re-engage, I guess. I'll something? make a motion to re-engage Hatch with the provisos that we discussed, that it be a Massachusetts uh, PE with experience in with the stormwater handbook, and that their review is, ju is just about compliance with the Massachusetts stormwater handbook. You know, not, nothing about federal standards um, and things. So there was, you know, and yeah. There was a lot of other in, extraneous information in their prior reports, and we just need to get them to focus strictly on the stormwater handbook compliance. And specifically, Second. I think stormwater standards uh, two and three, in fact, we can even narrow it, narrow it to that, because I think that's what we're discussing. Those are the two remaining issues. Sure. Uh, I see Mike has his hand up. Is that for a second? Uh, it's a second, but I also had a question that is that, uh, do we have the funds to hire a third party? Well, we'll get an estimate and present those to the, to the applicant and they will submit the check. That's a second. Sure. Okay. Um, Brian McBride. Yes. Susan, Ka uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Uh, Mike Gildas game? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Uh, can I get a motion to extend? Well, here's the question. Is it going to be the 16th or should we give ourselves a little bit more time to get this in order? You can always come back to the uh, on the 16th and do some housekeeping. And David Morgan has his hand up. I apologize. I didn't realize my video was off there. Um, Hatch has two principals out on unexpected medical leave for likely at least a month. So I think their turnaround time on this is going to be delayed. I would recommend going longer than the next meeting. Or another consultant. Right. Mm -hmm. Fresh news. So the next meeting would be June 6th. Um, if it wasn't May 16th, uh, we, we did have a second, didn't we have a second bid on the stormwater proposal, um, peer review? Could we, was it SWC also submitted a proposal? I, I'd hate to change horses a little bit, but if, if it's faster for them just to pick up this narrower peer review, they have to... if we did, we can go back to the bids and check and get, uh, a request out to both of them, if you'd like. 
I, yeah, I think in fairness to the applicant, whoever can do it, do it sooner. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, modify the vote to uh, go out for bid on the two applicants that submitted bids on the last round. Yeah. Um, so if someone wants to so move, and then we'll get a second and go through this so, again. So moved. Second. Sure, sure. Uh, Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Sorry, yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game? Yeah. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. And we want to continue until June 6th. Is that acceptable, uh, Dominic? Yeah. Sorry, just Chuck, one thing. Why don't we, if, if, and if the applicant's amenable to this, why don't we continue to the next meeting just in case we need to vote on a peer reviewer? Sure. Okay, let's do that. Right. Stephanie, is that okay with you? Yes. Just in caution. Yes. I mean, again, if if there's nothing to report, you can request a continuance. You don't have to show up. But if we have something, I just don't want to hold it up inadvertently. If we get a proposal from SWC, we need to vote on it so you guys can get that. Can, I, can I just update everybody? The proposal for stormwater was from Kleinfelder, Weston Sampson, and Hatch. Weston Sampson was conflicted out. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, Kleinfelder was not, so that's a possibility. SWCA only sent in a proposal, at least what I have for pl planting plan. I think you're right. I'm misremembering. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to say that for the record. And if I may, Mr. Chair, that that I was just going to say that I looked up who it was. It was Kleinfelder, and um, and to answer the question, yes, we would appreciate the continuance to the um, what's the date of May hearing? Sixteenth. Sixteenth. And then, as as Daniel said, if if um, there's just something procedural, we can do that quickly and and move on. Sounds good. Uh, one so of the commissioners, moved. thank you. Second. 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 Mike Gildas game. Uh, Brian McBride. Oh. Brian's off, so I'll go to Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stephen. Yes. Ask Brian McBride again. We get a quorum. Chuck Taroni says yes. So yeah. we're good. Okay. So that's that. You there, yeah. Brian? Are you voting? No, it's over. It's oh, over. over. Uh, we're moving on to uh, the high school. Thank you. Night. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank so you. Chuck, just, just for my, um, sorry. Um, there were so many votes there. So the last one was Nathaniel and Mike to continue the meeting or no? Yes, it was, yeah. most of them were Nathaniel and Mike. Okay, to continue to the 16th? The 16th, 16th okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's turn to the... Oh, some of them trying to finish this before me. Yes. Oops, hold on. Uh, hold on a second, uh, whoever's talking. Uh, so we have an amendment to uh, DEP file number 90. 0332 uh, order of conditions for 869 Massachusetts Ave. It's the Arlington High School. Uh, and what, what we want to do here tonight is uh, the following orders the same thing as we did. The last hearing, the performance will bring us up to date on the amendment request. And then we're going to acknowledge the emails that we've received. And then I'm going to ask for staff for any updates if there are any. And then I'm going to take questions from and comments from the commission. And then we'll take questions and comments from the public. Uh, so certainly at this hour, I don't think there'll be enough time to discuss this in full tonight. So when we finish the hearing, I'm, I believe I'm going to have to ask the applicant to continue into our May 16th meeting. Uh, but if we do get finished and we're efficient time, we will take up the extension to this permit. So with that, uh, can uh, the applicant uh, introduce your team for the record before you get started? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so my name is Jeff Thielman. I'm the chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee. Just a reminder, I think the term school committee was used in the last meeting by some of the members. This is a presentation and a request by the Arlington High School Building Committee. And I'm going to allow uh, all the folks in the room and on Zoom uh, from our team to introduce themselves. Go ahead. Jim Feeney, town manager. John Amato, JJA Sports. 
Steve Garvin, Samios Consultant, Civil Engineer. Arthur Duffy, HMFH Architects. Lori Coles, HMFH Architects. Uh, Jim Burroughs, Wisconsin. Liz Hellman, Superintendent of Schools. Dr. Allison Ampey. Dr. Allison Ampey, um, School Committee <clears throat> and Building Committee. Okay, so Thank a you. reminder, we'll put up on the screen, Chuck, uh, with your permission. Oh, also, I'm sorry, John Lamar is here from Consigli. John, you want to introduce yourself? John Lamar, Consigli Construction Company. Thank you. Well, with your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll put up our PowerPoint. It's a review of all information and materials you've received in the past, but we're going to use this to kind of move through the presentation. So, sure thing. Yep. Are we good? We are good. Yes. I okay. just want you to note the time and maybe if we've seen it before, go go a little bit quicker I'll go on, quicker. Those, on those slides. For a school committee meeting, it's not that late, but okay. Uh, <laughs> we're here um, to request your approval of an amendment uh, to the order of conditions that you granted for the New Arlington High School and an extension of the uh, order of conditions to complete construction of the high school by 2026. The amendment accommodates modifications, minor modifications based on new information and our discussions with the commission. Um, so let me first speak about the amendment. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> so let me um, begin by recapping briefly the process that led us to this point. Arlington High School was invited into the MSBA building program in 2016. The program outlined a specific sequence of steps and requirements in exchange for partial state funding. As part of this process, the Arlington High School Building Committee pursued a lengthy and thoughtful course in which we examined multiple field options. Ultimately, the committee voted, voted to build the fields of the new high school with synthetic turf. In making our decision, we considered the needs of our students to have as much outdoor sports and activity time as possible, our desire to enhance and expand the town's recreational assets, and our responsibility to protect the town's natural resources, including Millbrook. I think we all know this, but I'll say it briefly. These fields were part of the overall project design presented to Arlington voters in 2019. The debt exclusion was approved with a positive vote of 76.9%. And uh, this uh, was the voters saying yes to increasing their property taxes to build a new high school along with funding from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. The artificial surface fields were part of the design approved by the state and in turn by this commission. So to put the amendment in context, let's briefly summarize the meetings that have taken place between the High School Building Committee and the Conservation Commission about this matter. In July of 2020, the Conservation Commission approved a three-year order of conditions which permitted the building project, including artificial fields that have Crum River infill, to move forward. Your affirmative vote indicated the fields as designed did not have a significant or cumulative effect upon the wetland values protected by the bylaw. Per the approved order of conditions, the scope and plans for the fields were detailed in the project scope and budget agreement the town of Arlington signed with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Seven contracts were signed pursuant to the order of conditions in 2021 for work to be performed in the fields. When we signed the contracts, we were able to lock into pricing at 2021 rates. <clears throat> in July of 2023, the Arlington High School Building Committee applied for a routine extension of the order of conditions. During meetings about the extension, the Conservation Commission told the Arlington High School Building Committee of new concerns pertaining to 6PBD and 6PBD Quinone. The commission then granted a one-year extension of the order of conditions. In February of 2024, nearly three months ago, we asked to come before the commission to discuss our research and we were placed on your agenda on April 4th, 2024, four months ahead of the order's expiration date. At that meeting, as you requested, we presented our analysis of the applicability of the cited research to the specific conditions in the Arlington High School campus and fields. As we explained a month ago, we are in the final critical 20 months of this project, and we have limited funds in our construction contingency. We need to use those funds carefully, and as our town manager explained, using additional town funds for this project only results in less funding from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Per your request, 
the building committee re-examined evidence and information about turf fields. As we explained last month, we carefully explored four alternative infill products. Even if funds were not an issue, the superintendent and her staff concluded that there were not sufficiently tested and acceptable organic infill products that they could recommend at this time to the building committee. Additionally, they had concerns about athlete safety on those surfaces. As a result, the Arlington High School Building Committee voted unanimously in March of 2024 to reaffirm our decision to purchase crumb rubber infill for the artificial turf fields. As we have explained, in time, when other services have more experience, the school district can re-examine options when the school needs to replace this infill. We're now in phase three of the high school building project and beginning work on phase four, which includes the fields. We have a deadline of June 30th, 2024, less than 60 days from today, to finalize the purchase of the infill for the fields. If we do not meet this deadline, the fields will not be ready for the fall 2025 sports season. The project runs the risk of cost overruns. The town may lose already approved funding from the Massachusetts School Building Authority and an unresolved disagreement between an MBA, MSBA sanctioned school building committee and another commission or body in the same community will jeopardize future state funding for capital projects for Arlington school system. Finally, the high school building committee and our contractors and subcontractors understand that the order of conditions applies to the entire project. And therefore, all work on the project must stop. We do not have an approved order of conditions from the conservation commission. As detailed the last month's meeting, the Arlington High School Building Committee and its consultants reviewed multiple studies and concluded that the conditions needed to create 6 PBD Queen Own are not present in the HS fields as designed. This slide, which you saw last month, shows a representation of production conditions for 6 PPD Queen Own. On the left, you see conditions that exist along a highway. Cars travel at high speed, creating minute particles of tire braid which react with UV light from the sun and smog from the cars, allowing the creation of 6 PBD queen oak. Some of these particles can then be washed into the ecosystem. On the right, you can see the conditions that would exist in the AHS fields. The rubber infill particles are much larger. There are no vehicular weight forces to deconstruct rubber infill or any smog from cars. There is limited UV light from the sun as the infill is shaded by carpet fiber. Thus, the conditions that are needed to produce 6 pd quinone are not found in the field. Additionally, the drainage system and conditions in the field do not allow particles to run off directly to waterways as is present in other studies. Next slide. <clears throat> A quick reminder that in our meeting on April 4th, 2024, we explained that crub rubber infill is very different from tire braid. First, the particle sizes are extremely different. Tire braid varies in size from one micron to 1,000 microns in diameter, while the infill ranges from 1,000 microns to 2,360 microns. Additionally, tire braid as described in the research article is a heterogeneous composition of rubber, mineral particles, and dust from the other traffic related wear particles such as brake wear. It has been found to contain many metals and heavy metals. In comparison, the infill is sourced only from domestic tires. Infill is washed, free from dust, and independently tested to be free from extractable heavy metals and PFAS. Next slide. <clears throat> so also at last month's meeting, we walked through the field stormwater management plan and the filtration steps, uh, which treat nearly all inflow prior to reaching Mill Brook. In our discussion last month, you got to keep going there, the, condition, the commission noted that order condition number 57 requires the Arlington High School Building Committee to submit the synthetic turf infill specifications and the accompanying operation and maintenance manual and maintenance training for this product. That manual with the information you required was included in our April 17th, 2024 submission to you. So let's move to this specific matter before the commission. Based on condition 56 in the order of conditions, the Arlington High School Building Committee, which you requested and we discussed in our last meeting, is requesting an amendment to the existing order due to new information presented in July and August of 2023 regarding a study from California on the effects of 6-PPD quinone on coho salmon and other fish. 
The HSBC has shown that the findings of this report do not apply to the conditions in the design fields of the new Arlington High School. Nonetheless, the Arlington High School Building Committee is proposing to add additional protections and precautions to the project based on this information, which we discussed in detail in our last meeting, but I'm going to review briefly now. As we discussed in our last meeting, we want to add stormwater filter baskets to the turf fields collection basin system. We reviewed this proposal in detail. The baskets briefly will sit within the originally designed basins requiring no change in the design or layout of the system. The cut sheet we included in this presentation includes seed screens for the basins. The baskets enhance the system's ability to capture sediment, removing small particles in an earlier filtration step, allowing for visual monitoring of the amounts of captured sediment and facilitating the removal of sediment from the system. The updated operation and maintenance plan included in our submission of April 17th, 2024, includes monthly inspections the first year then quarterly maintenance of these baskets after that. Next slide. Last time, we also talked about a sampling port. I'm gonna review it briefly. We went into some detail in our last meeting. We proposed to install a sampling port within the 12 inch high density polyethylene a line that leaves the easternmost section of the drainage system prior to entering DMH5, drainage mantle 5. This port will be used in the future to sample for 6 PVD quinone after a testing protocol and procedure is established by either one or both the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency or the Massachusetts uh, Department of Environmental Protection. The Arlington High School Building Committee agrees to follow the more stringent of these requirements as we discussed at length in our last meeting of these two governing agencies as part of this amendment request. The port allows the school district to monitor for this new chemical when a testing protocol is in place. We went through this last week as well, last month as well, but let me go through it quickly. I would like to address the, uh, the proposed, but this also helps to address the proposed special condition that came our way earlier this week. The synthetic turf field cross-section consists of a one inch resilient drainage pad in 1.3 inches of infill within the matrix of the fiber blades totaling 2.3 inches of material with approximately 33% of voids. The void space within this section will retain approximately a half inch to three quarters of an inch equivalent depth of rainfall depth in water due to capillary action before generating any actual measurable runoff. The 0.25 inch rainfall event in the proposed special conditions is therefore not a measurable event in terms of runoff. The proposed special conditions <clears throat> that uh, came our way on Monday afternoon require the town of Arlington and the school district to use a draft method of testing six PPD quinone. The town and the school committee and the school district rather cannot agree to this. The draft method of six, six, 1634 uh, reads as follows. This document represents the first draft of method 1634 for six PPD quinone currently under development by the EPA Office of Water Engineering and Analysis in collaboration with EPA Region 10 and EnviroFins Environment Testing Northern California. This method is not approved for Clean Water Act compliance monitoring unless and until it has been proposed and promulgated through rulemaking. A single, and you can see the rest of the quote there, a single laboratory validation study tested the method on surface water and stormwater runoff matrices and the report on the results of that study has been uh, prepared. A multi-laboratory validation study is anticipated at a later date. The study has not gone through a proper rulemaking process and the Environmental Protection Agency is telling us not to use it. Therefore, the town cannot use a draft study. Finally, the proposed special conditions include suggested language about monitoring the migration of infill material within the buffer zone. This is already addressed in the maintenance plan we have submitted to the commission and discussed in our past meetings. Also, as we've discussed in our meeting on April 4th, that proposed condition is outside of the scope of this amendment, which we talked about in our last meeting. We appreciate the spirit of stewardship with the Conservation Commission. As we outlined in our last meeting, we are both, both the commission and the, the high school building committee are, is responsible for a brook that run, uh, runs underneath our high school. Uh, where our students play and perform and participate in sports. The second part of uh, this uh, request today is to extend 
the order of conditions. Um, and I can stop right here because I think the first part you want to talk about, Chuck, is the amendment. Is that correct? Sure. And are you All still, right. when you get to that, are you still requesting three years? Yeah. Uh, were we Two years. So it's two years, Chuck. We started in last year, went to August 4th, 2024. We want to do what we originally asked for, which is August 4th, 2026. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sure. Uh, let's turn quickly we'll take to the questions. Yeah, let's turn quickly to the commission and uh, can see who's uh, raising their hand. I think that um, uh, I think that I was uh, anticipating that um, Susan Chabnick would speak first. I think that she uh, uh, put a lot of stuff up on the website and uh, has some uh, has some information to discuss. So, Susan, I'll just leave it at that and turn it over to you at this point. Thanks, Chuck. Um, Nathaniel, did you want to go first or? Thanks. Well, I okay. think you're going to address the slide that was put <laughs> up about uh, the building committee not wishing to use the standard that you proposed by EPA. 1634. Um, so I just wanted to hear your comments more. There was a comment after the bold about it should not be used for compliance with the Clean Water Act, which I don't find completely relevant because we're not administering the Clean Water Act, but I think I understand the point that it's dealing with water quality. Now, nevertheless, it is the second two sentences about laboratory validation, which I would like your input on. Sure. Um, I can answer that first, and then I, I have a few other um, comments. Um, so, so the lab that performed um, this draft method with EPA is considered one of the premier labs in the U.S. It's Eurofins in California. Um, there's only two labs that I know of that do this method right now. That's that lab and a lab in Canada. Um, it's a very um, well-written, rigorous method. I, I talked to the, pe the uh, people at the laboratory who worked with EPA, did not speak with EPA. Um, and they said they don't anticipate there being any major revisions to this method. Um, they if you read that preamble in the method itself, um, EPA often encourages um, agencies, uh, localities, businesses, industries to use draft methods until a final method is promulgated. However, just not for regulatory purposes of the Clean Water Act, like you said, Nathaniel, and that's listed in here. So I'll read. The final paragraph of the beginning of the notice to the draft, which says, in the meantime, the Office of Water is releasing this draft on its website. Laboratories, regulatory authorities, and other interested parties are encouraged to review the method and where appropriate, utilize it for their own purposes with the explicit understanding that this is a draft method subject to revision. So um, sometimes to protect the environment, we need to make decisions before the regulations catch up with us. We all know about PFAS and we've we've heard about that. And you know, just a few years ago, the state had a level of 70 part per trillion in PFAS. Now EPA is saying four part per trillion is the level we should look at for several PFAS compounds. And actually we should have nothing in our water, non-detect zero. So these emerging contaminants of which six PPD quinone is an emerging contaminant we find out that they're potentially harmful to the environment way before the regulations catch up. Does that mean we shouldn't pay attention to them? Mm. No, it means we should pay attention to them. Um, I take my responsibility as a conservation commissioner um, very seriously. I'm sure the rest of the commissioners do as well. And that means to protect the environment to protect the wetland environment under the Wetlands Protection Act um, requires that I uphold the eight interests of the act. And one of them is to prevent pollution. And the tire crumb rubber 
has the potential to release 6-PPD quinone into the environment. I respectfully disagree with the Arlington High School Building Committee's conclusion that 6-PPD quinone will not come off the tires. 6-PPD quinone is already on the tire particles. These tire crumb rubber particles were created from used tires. Used tires already have 6-PPD quinone on the tires. So the question of whether or not there is the environment to create 6-PPD quinone from 6-PPD may not be the big issue. The big issue may be it's already there. I do appreciate that the building committee has agreed to add a basket to capture particles, including tire crumb rubber, because particulates and plastics in the environment are also of grave concern, as we've discussed. And I do appreciate a port to be able to sample the stormwater that comes out of the system to make sure that it doesn't have 6-PPD quinone that might affect Millbrook where it would end up. Um, I'm disappointed that the building committee is not considering using this method to prove that they're not contaminating the environment with this material, especially since the building committee has been very clear that they don't think any 6-PPD quinone will come off at all. So then what is the harm in giving us um, the data to show that we're being protective? We, that is, we are not opposed. We are in favor of uh, the testing. We don't wanna do it until the regulation is approved. That's all. We're in favor of the testing. We're putting in the tort, the port to test. So we've made that very, very clear. Right. I and I, I appreciate clear. that. I appreciate that. The problem with waiting until the method is approved is twofold. One, we can't get a baseline. If we don't test the subsurface system where you put the carpet on, we mm -hmm. don't know what the baseline is. Now we could just say, okay, baseline is non-detect. That may or may not be true. There may be a, a small level that's in the environment. Um, if you want to agree that baseline is non-detect and measure later, then that's one point. The second point is if this method doesn't get promulgated because EPA is not very fast all the time, for four years, we have potentially allowed four years of an impact that we are uncertain about and we had knowledge might happen. I don't feel comfortable as a steward of protecting the wetland environment to allow that. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else on the commission who would like to, uh, has a question, a comment? Yeah, I, I had one question about what Jeff said. Uh, Jeff, you had mentioned your, in response to, I think, the third proposed condition that you received earlier this week about developing a plan to monitor migration of infill materials. You you spoke quickly, and I just didn't catch it. You said that that's already covered in the existing order of conditions, or is it in your proposed uh, O and M plan that you're you submitted as part of this this amendment right. request? How much gets migrated? Right. The, so mushroom. I spoke quickly because the chair told me to. I um, did. Yes, I understand that. Let me make that clear. Yeah. No, I didn't. So I was and it's all, we're also dealing with <laughs> okay. the so I was following hear. direction. Yeah. Uh, let's. I want to make we make sure we're clear on that. So, um, the uh, my understanding, Nathaniel is that it's in the operation and maintenance fund. Is that correct? There is some monitoring of that, but I don't know exactly how it's written, so I won't quote that yet. Yeah. We have tasks 
We have tasks we're, we're supposed to do. Yeah, we have tasks we're supposed to do. To check the to we, check the info. To kit. ensure that you don't have that migration, right? So, right. so right. And, I see something in here about the checking the baskets, yeah. sweep, sweeping, right. um, yeah. yeah, basin filter baskets, check that, blah, 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 blah. But anything about you know it being tra sort of tracked off the field, you know, not not through the stormwater system, I guess that I'm getting at. And I think that's what this con this proposed condition is getting at is checking around the field because yes, we're anticipating that the baskets will catch things that go through the stormwater system, right? But right. if this condition is derived from the concept that athletes, you know, uh, I haven't played soccer, no, I haven't played on a sports field in a while, but I do recall you often athletes go off the field, right, in different directions after the ball, whatever. And that could track the material off, you know, beyond the bounds of the field where the stormwater system is. So I think that's what that condition is getting. That's that's the, I think, one of the purposes of that proposed condition. And Nathaniel, if I could interrupt, there's yeah. a street there's a street sweeping condition twice a year. Right, but the street sweeper is not going to be sweeping around the field, is it? Well, I, I thought the point was that you wanted to capture well, it before it entered to yeah. the resource area, yeah. and the uh, this may do it. Uh, yes, it says it proposes the parking and drive areas to be swept with a wet, wet brush. My recollection is that there's no drive areas or parking lot between the field and uh, oh. Mill Brook, but I don't have the site plan in front of me. So that's, a, that's, that's my comment. All right, I think, did we answer your question? Yes, I think so. Sure. Yeah, I, I have an answer. Yep. Thank you, you want to play soccer on the field? We can no, make no that thanks. That's okay. not Kersey had a comment, uh, Chuck, and Dr. Allison Ampey had a comment, and it's probably insightful. Can she speak? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now the pressure's on. Um, first, I think that um, Arthur, you can uh, correct me, but I believe there's pavement in between yeah. the Millbrook and uh, the fields. Um, so there, there, think, yeah. Yeah, so the street sweeping should catch anything before it gets to the Melbrook. Oh, um, thank you. And second, just to speak to um, Ms. Chaknik's concern that the tires already have 60 BDQ. So this is true, but you have to understand that it's dependent on the surface area to the volume of the particles. And as the particle gets smaller, the surface area in comparison is much larger. And so the tires are huge compared to these, um, the infill and stuff. And the amount of surface area that's on the tire that would undergo a transformation from 60 PD to 60 PDQ is very small compared to what ends up happening in on the roadway with the tire abrade, which is so, so much smaller. Um, so I think to say that there has to be 6 PBDQ in the tires, you, yes, that's true. But in terms of how much there is, and especially in terms of how much there is in comparison to what is already coming into the brook from all the roadways, from all the car traffic that's happening is um, frustrating to me. So um, I think to say that it's in the tires and therefore we have to test for it, you have to understand that there isn't you're just because it's in the studies from the roadways doesn't mean that that's the level that you're getting from the tires um and that's going to be into the info so that's all thank you uh two commission members have their hands up i'm not sure who was first i'm going to call on david white thank you um Okay. Okay. Well, my scientific background says one needs data. There's uncertainty. One needs the data to resolve that uncertainty. I think testing 
if it comes up a negative result, we need to have to resolve the uncertainty rather than just speculate what might or might not happen. I think we need data. Sure. Mike killed this game. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes, I understand the building committee's uh, reticence to go for testing uh, based on the draft uh, nature of the uh, statements uh, of, the, of the testing. However, I would suggest, as Susan uh, suggested, that what's the harm in starting the testing now, uh, seeing as those draft regulations or draft specifications are likely to show up pretty much the way they are now. And you'd have that baseline uh, of information that uh, basically David was saying and, and Susan Chaptick was saying, uh, and you're going to have the ability to get samples out of that new manhole you're going to be putting in. So why not just go for it sooner rather than later? Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's going to be a response. We'll wait till the end. Uh, Brian McBride. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm a little more sympathetic to the building committee's reluctance on the new test, uh, having been a chemist myself. Uh, I don't know if there's a like third way here where we could write some uh, write some guidance that would say uh, the test should be used uh, once validated. However, if it's not validated within one year, the test should be used in that case. That would give the industry time to do some uh, um, testing, you know, actual use of the test and improvements and some period of time would pass where other people would be doing the guinea pig work for us. And then after some reasonable period of time, we would just say, well, if EPA is just moving too slowly, let's implement the test now. That might be a middle path. Okay. Uh, sure, can I get um, David Kaplan? Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess, you know, I, I don't understand the, te the testing methodology, um, you know, and the implications of what it would do to the data that was collected if there were a future change. I mean, I, I just, I guess it's, you know, I guess, again, I'm a little more sympathetic um, to the, um, the applicant, you know, based on the potential for, you know, undertaking an expensive sampling um, project with the potential for that data to be questioned in the future if there were any changes to that method. So uh, maybe Susan or maybe somebody could could answer what the what the chances are that I, I hear it's unlikely to be changed, but if it were to be changed, does that change our baseline understanding and yeah uh, uh, of that of that chemical? Sure, uh, Miss Ampi, I'll just wait and uh, have uh, Susan answer this question, and you can speak right after that. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so, David, yeah. Um, this is a um, uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry attached to another mass spectrometer. Very sophisticated method. These are the kinds of methods that they also use. It's an isotope dilution method. So you're looking at the actual sample and putting isotopes. That's like another form of the chemical you're really looking for. So you're not using surrogate chemicals or chemicals that are like this to try to quantify it, you're using the actual chemical. Um, so that really sophisticated methods, similar to methods that are used for dioxin furans and PFAS, you know, really sophisticated. That said, um, I, I understand the hesitancy about using a draft method. What, what usually happens when these methods get validated is they try to make them a little bit more robust. So they change the extraction a little bit to make sure that from lab to lab, it's the same. Sometimes they make the allowable quality control sample um, control limits broader if, if this was developed by one lab who could do it really well. And then they do five labs and they say, well, you know, instead of doing 
um, 80 to 120 percent recovery as as a good number. We're saying it's really 70 to 130 because you know labs can't reproduce that. Those are the kinds of changes that are usually made. I would also say that in my 30 years of experience in analytical chemistry, the other changes that are often made are to make it more sensitive and actually allow the method to look lower at a lower detection limit than what it's looking at now at a lower concentration. Um, so if you use a draft method and you get a non-detect, you might use the final method and get something detected because often that's what they do is push the detection levels down. Um, so that's that's been my experience. I guess my other point, um, just for what everybody said, um, is that if you don't expect it to be there, and this is a concern um, in the literature from um, California, from uh, ITRC, that's the Interstate Technology <laughs> um, Consortium, put out a very good review paper on 6PPD. Um, there are some actual data that come off of soccer mounds in Europe that show low levels of 6-PPD quinone. So this, if, but if you're feeling it's really not going to come off the tire crumb rubber, then why not just test for it? And and I appreciate Brian, you you proposing a compromise um, on using the draft method and, and setting a time limit. Thank you. Um, Allison? Did I just, okay. I hear an echo. Okay. Sure, please, yeah, unmute yourself. Okay. I, um, yeah, so a few things. So first, um, mm -hmm. we're not just objecting to the testing. It's the way it's the entire condition as it's written. First, to ask for a sample prior to field construction. We won't be able to get that sample because we don't have a drainage to test. So we can't fulfill that condition because there is nothing to take that baseline from. Um, second, the concern is not just that the test is not yet uh, complete, but also what is the standard that it's being compared against? Um, Ms. Chapman ha ch has mandated certain levels, but is that, are those the correct levels? Uh, also, how many samples are we looking at and over what time period? Finally, what are the levels in the brook? Because if, even if there's 6PPDQ in the outflow from the field, if it's higher in the brook, we shouldn't need to be mitigating the field I mean, depending on how far the differences are. And finally, I just want to point out that for the uh, study that was um, from California that Ms. Jacknick has been quoting from, the first page talks about this profile is not a regulatory document and does not impose any regulatory requirements. So I feel like we're having information used in ways that are not professionally consistent. And this is very frustrating. And we don't want to, you know, yes, we don't think it's going to be a problem, but we don't want to sign up for things where we're agreeing to something which we can't do because it doesn't, the field construction doesn't even exist. Um, or that the standards and stuff are not well written. So this is why we feel it's more appropriate to wait until we have a method that has been promulgated by either the EPA or the mass DEP um, and going forward from there. Thank you. Is he, uh, Chuck, let me punch it. Chuck, can I just, so I mean, I think I just want to make sure the conversation that we just had 
about testing assumes the crumb rubber infill surface is down, it's in. You can't test until it's in. So we, it sounds like there's agreement on that, that's good. But we, we can't, and the, the order of conditions would expire in August of 2026. And prior to that date, we would be meeting with the Conservation Commission and we would have a better idea of the test, of, the, of what's, what's happening with testing. And we can do the testing based on wherever the EPA is, is at, at, the, at that point. We can't test until the field is down. You've agreed the field has to be tested. We do as well. You've also agreed the field needs to be down to test. So we're all in agreement on that. I think we can't do it until we, August of 26, when we come back to you to extend the order of conditions, we can have this conversation. Yeah. We can do it then. And by then the EPA test will be farther along. Thank you. Uh, David Morgan. I have a question about the impact of 6-PPD quinone. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey was just describing the levels that are potentially in Millbrook and the need to mitigate the field relative to potentially higher levels. Is the is 6-PPD quinone cumulative in a way that, you know, we move past certain thresholds and it gets worse? Or are we talking about there's a threshold and beyond that all bets are off? Um, is there any clarity on the matter? I can see Susan has her hands. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So so given that this is this is a an, a new emerging contaminant, there's not a lot of information on it. However, the studies that have been done so far, um, 6 PPD quinone has toxicity to coho salmon at part per trillion levels. That's really low. It has toxicity to brook trout at part per billion levels. So that's an order of magnitude different. And then it has mm. several other toxicities. Those are toxicities to kill them. Those are LD50s. Those are, you know, 50% of a population dies at that level. The um, ITRC fact sheet that I put in the materials that I submitted with the materials is, is a very good review of what's available. However, we have no idea of the subchronic, the sublethal um, potential effects of 6-PPD. There's been some studies, 6-PPD quinone, sorry. There have been some, stud some studies on zebrafish showing effects on reproduction. Um, there's been some on fish showing behavioral effects and, and feeding effects, but there's really no you know, comprehensive study. It's still being studied. That said, I do agree that roadways are likely to be a much larger input of 6-PPD quinone to our waterways than tire crumb rubber infill in a turf field. However, that doesn't mean we negate that additional source. So let me give you an analogy. Okay, we're concerned about CSOs, combined sewer overflows, in Alewife Brook, which runs through Arlington. That's bacteria, as we should be. So just because the brook has high levels of E. coli or other bacteria, does that mean we shouldn't control a source that has lower levels than that? I don't think so. So at this, the same analogy is with PFAS. When the state has been looking at PFAS in different drinking water aquifers, and I know we don't have that in the town of Arlington, but just as an analogy, they're looking at sources. And the source can be less than the amount that's in that aquifer, but they don't want any additional source. And 6-PPD quinone is kind of like that just because it's toxic at such very low levels, at least 
in the scientific literature to the aquatic organisms that have been studied. And they are also starting to study other ones like terrestrial um, earthworms and finding some um, uh, chronic effects, not acute effects. So I don't know if that was a long-winded answer to a lot that we don't know. <laughs> okay, I see that uh, Sandra uh, Rifai. Um, sorry, uh, can I check this so, sure. Check this one person in the room has wants to speak. Our our consultant uh, John. Can Amara. you hold on one second? Uh, sure, Jeff. Please. Yep. Your John consultant. Dorn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the the reason the reason that we follow this path uh, that we're going down is very much tied to coho salmon and coho salmon dying. The the syndrome, the morbidity syndrome that takes place in Northwest United States, Washington State, take place in Canada, several places. They're all connected to highways. They're all connected to large traffic flows. Um, in between Tacoma and Seattle, there is the Mill, the Miller's Brook, Miller Brook, Miller Creek, actually, if I get it right. And about 60,000 cars a day travel on that highway. Once a year, during the period of beginning of October to the end of October, there's a series of rain events. And those rain events are adequate to wash all the dry summer roads free and clear, all the highways free and clear of the crumb rubber abrade. And that abrade is tiny and it floats away rather rapidly in a big rain event. In a, in, a, in, a course of, in the course of half a year, you could easily be putting in 30 metric tons of tire abrade right into the river, the brook, the creek, the creek, all in one shot. And what happens is they're getting what we call shock kills. The, the concentration of the chemical gets in the water it spreads through the water rapidly and the fish die. They're going upstream as that stuff's going downstream and they die. It doesn't happen any other time of year. This is when it happens. We don't have those conditions in Arlington. We don't have large volumes. We may have a pound flushing off in a, in a, a month, but we don't have you know 30 metric tons in one location just pouring into the river during a rain event. And the way the rain flows in Seattle uh, the way the rain curve for the year looks, there's a dip in the summertime. There's not enough rain to wash the roads. And when it gets to September, it starts to increase. But by the time October rolls around, they have one, two inch rain events and they sweep the roads clean. And that happens all at once. So what we're doing is we're trying to we're trying to look realistic at the likelihood of something happening. We're looking at 30 metric tons going in in one shot compared to a pound or two going into another brook. And then we're going to look back and say, okay, coho salmon are by far more sensitive than alewife, for example. They can handle a much tougher environment. Brook trout can handle, uh, not brook trout, uh, bass can handle a much tougher environment uh, and they'll survive. But coho salmon are what dies. The, the trout, uh, rainbow trout, brook trout, I, I didn't hear any reports or seen any reports about them dying in the Northwest uh, rain events but they happen to the coho salmon because they're sensitive. So we're looking at apples and oranges in terms of, no, we're looking at apples and watermelons in terms of, of what we have here for load in Arlington compared to what we have in Seattle. And we're looking at the same thing relative to the, the, um, the likelihood of the fish that we have because they're a much tougher species. Usually water quality uh, discharges allow certain things to happen if certain species don't exist. Uh, we don't have areas of critical concern here in Arlington. I think the nearest area of critical concern is probably about five miles away. Uh, so we don't have those types of environments. I understand we have to keep clean, but what you're saying is that we should monitor this now because of an extreme condition that takes place in Washington. And we're not saying we're not gonna monitor, we're saying we will monitor, but you can't monitor before the field is built, because it's just crushed stone. The crushed stone will flow right into the water and the crushed stone will flow into the drainage system and you'll get crushed stone in your sample. So you're not gonna get anything that way. There's, not, there's no advantage to doing that. So build the field, test it, 
the conditions are so extremely different that you're not going to get the same kind of event unless you bring coho here but even that that won't work because they won't survive anyway all right thank you thank you john uh, sure i'm sorry but your screen says sandra so if you could introduce yourself for the record sure my name is craig breen um sandra's husband Hi. <laughs> Um, we're both PhD chemists. Um, we've been looking at this once we found out that there was some concern. The EPA is cl clearly all over this. They uh, have released a couple, like two part, it's a two part study with a lot of sampling on uh, artificial turf, higher crumb rubber. Um, they, while 6PPD, I was just going back and referencing it. While that, that wasn't part of their study, because it again, as um, Susan has mentioned, it's a it's a relatively new uh, you know chemical of interest of concern. Um, they they basically went back through their data and looked for any chemical formulas that would be um, even close to six ppd and did not find any um, in yeah in the tire crumb rubber that's used in artificial turf. So I think. Just going by that data alone, uh, I feel like this is a very low uh, probability uh, in addition to all the other very good um, rundowns around this requires certain conditions, surface area that's been said, all that. So um, yeah, I, I find it hard to believe that we would see it. And as uh, the, the, the high school team has said, they're not against doing the the testing. It's just let's get the field in, and then we can we can monitor down the road. And I think that's that seems like a very prudent and practical approach. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Susan. I see your hand is up. Thank you, Chuck. Um, thank you for that comment um, from the public as well. Um, uh, going through that data, what, what EPA did is it looks for patterns, um, and it's it's not surprising that they may not have seen the pattern. Maybe it's really not there, um, but it's also they don't have a standard. They weren't looking for this compound, so this compound wasn't in their calibration standards, which I'm sure if you're PhDs, you, you understand that. Um, so it's not surprising to me that it could be there at some level and it wasn't found, or maybe it wasn't there. Um, so I'll just leave that where it is. Um, that's a question mark. Um, going back to the coho salmon, um, there's been other literature. It's not just coho salmon. Um, the ITRC paper, uh, the fact sheet, has a table one reported 6-PPD quinone LC50 concentrations. LC means what what 50% of the um the the fish die, um, 50% observed mortality um, at a certain level of concentration of 6 PPD quinone. And it clearly states um, brook trout, rainbow trout, steelhead. Um, there's some others in there. Um, it also has in the rest of the report um, some not not acute like that, but chronic effects, as I said before. So it's not just coho salmon. That is the big deal, obviously, because that's what spurred this whole um, interest in 6-PPD quinone. And EPA has a web page on 6-PPD quinone now, um, and they say... <laughs> you know, they're supporting research on it and they don't know about it. Um, so, and that is true. Thank you. Uh, I see sure. David. Yep, I see David too. Um, so, uh, and David, I'll get to you in a second. Hey, so a question came up about um, not so much what's going down the storm drains and, and we know that, but I think I'm getting a sense that maybe the commission wants to understand how far away this field is from um, Millbrook, and possibly I would like to know, <laughs> maybe the commission too, where that test port is located. Uh, so, do we have? Is there a plan that someone can put on the screen, either David or the people from uh, the building committee? And 
David, while there, everyone's looking, please ask your question. My question was about coho salmon. Obviously, we don't have coho salmon in Arlington. It's a particularly sensitive species, it seems. Is that the case that it's really particularly sensitive? Is there some reason why these tests are done on coho salmon versus other species? And can we speak to the, the choice of the testing focusing on that particular species? Yeah, I, I can speak to that just very quickly while we're, we're looking at the other stuff. Um, the choice of, of coho salmon is, is exactly what the gentleman said um, from the building committee, is because that these cause major fish kills in um, the upper in the in the upper Midwest, upper, I'm sorry, in the Northwest, um, that if acutely affect um, the native populations as well. Um, and that's where it first came from. The, we've noticed these, we, the environmental communities, noticed these fish kills for years, and they never knew why. And then it was just found a few years ago why. And um, so that's why it started with coho. And then when it started with coho, um, different um, scientific research groups decided to look at related fish, related sal salmonids. And that's why they've looked at those. So a lot of fish have not been evaluated. And as you probably know, with toxicology, you know, people pick and choose what um, they think are related, what might be affected, what they can raise in a laboratory. I mean, sometimes it's, it's not, you can't, you can't test everything. Um, so, so that's where we are there. But there is a nice table in that ITRC that shows what has been tested so far, at least in the laboratory. However, like I said, again, it's not just fish kills. It's the effect on reproduction. It's the effect on behavior. There are sub-lethal effects. Are any of the ones that have been tested indicator species for other species? Um, I would say yes and no. So, you know, when you look at trout, you could say trout is related to, you know, alewife and herring. You know, you it depends upon how big you look at your, your relationships. If you go into genus or you go into family or so, yeah, I don't, I, I couldn't really speak to that. Chuck, you asked about the port. It's in the southeastern most, most part of the project. Do you have a plan view? Yeah. Yeah, a plan view would be great. Thank you. So so what I was going to, so I, I d also believe from looking at the plan, I think there's a lot of pavement between the field and Mill yeah. Brook. And so that the street sweeping seems to be, would take care of that or anything that comes on the surface mm -hmm. would take care of that unless it was a storm drain and, you know, in there. And so what what susan's talking about is the stormwater that go that hits the field and goes through the drainage system into the pvc pipe and then through the treatment train and then eventually and any filters that they have involved in this and then the overflow would eventually get into mo brook mm -hmm. which is you know which is pretty far away and i'm not just just for everyone who's listening outside of our jurisdiction but connected because you know unless and until you know we have we have an issue it's just pipe here break, so i just wanted people to see that yeah, although the field is far the away plan. the plan would be nice to uh to visualize and the storm water does go directly into mill brook there's someone and, on the building committee have a copy sure and, and then you share? have the uh in the synthetic turf stormwater uh, management system diagram on page 30, you also have kind of what your treatment train should look like, uh, but it's not the plan. So maybe the plan first. All right, we're looking for the- We're struggling with the device. We're struggling with the device here. Hang on. You wanna see, Chuck, you wanna see the, the, yeah. the plan itself and where it's located on the plan? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I think it would be nice for you to show us where the field is and, and where it discharges. 
And where, where you propose the uh, testing for it. Yep. Yeah. Hang on. Email. Or yeah. email it to David Morgan and he can email post it. He can screen share it. Um, or we can email to David Morgan. Do you have something to email to David Morgan? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there, there's a rendering on the website I found pretty quickly. You could just throw up the JPEG. I don't, I don't have a it on this computer. You got the, you got the website, or you got the row. Okay. There, there, there's something. I'm just saying, if if David wants to throw something up, um, there's a, there's a rendering overall site plan on the project page. That's overall site plan draft from go. 2020. Pulled it up pretty quickly. Okay. David, can you pull that up? As I find it, uh, Dave Kaplan, you want to drop the link in the chat so that we can all reference it? It'll be easy. Right. Yeah, I'll try. Sorry, I'm on two different computers and I found it on my other one. So okay. it's on the town website under, tell us how to get to it. No, David White's put one up. No, he's not. Okay. David White did? The link. Uh, he's got a different link. I just saw a link go up. I didn't read it. I think that's about 6 PVD. Mm. Hmm. David Morgan, did you find it? I haven't, no. I just got to email it. Oh. All right, hang on. I got it. You got it? Yeah, let me want to make sure it's the right one. Let me email it off to you, and you can put it on your screen. No, no, no I don't have my screen. Yet. I don't. Send it to David Morgan. Send it to David. Okay. Yeah. Can I send it to Dave? Yeah. Dave Morgan. Okay. Or. Right. Morgan I, just, email. I just threw the link in the chat. Sorry. There you go. Thank you, David Kaplan. So, David Morgan, you have the you have the link. David you. Kaplan gave you the link. Can you open it up? Opening it now. Yeah. Our computer here died, so we need you. Oh, no. <laughs> I, ha I have it on an email. If I have your email. No, no, David, no. He has to yeah, open that up. Can you open that up? There you go. There Thank you, go. David. All right. All right. All right. So, Dream Man 5 comes off the softball and football field. Right. Yeah. Right. So, it comes right where, just off where it says preschool. Right. No, it, it, it's it's over by the hammer throw. Right? By the hammer throw? That's, yeah. that's the softball field. Right. It's coming off okay. the softball and football field. Okay. I think Drayman Hall 5 is right there. It comes yeah. out in the middle of the campus. It comes out in the middle of the campus. Drain, drain off Man the Hall. softball and right field right there. right there, yeah. Yeah. Right. And it ties into right before Drayman Hall 5 is right there. So Drayman Hall 5 is just taking off the field. Nothing else is tying into it, right? So we're putting the port before it would tie in to the rest of the drainage system, which works its way through the parking lot before it overflows into uh, Millbrook towards the preschool. And can you right. just, where does Millbrook go under under the high school there? Sorry, is it under? It goes adjacent to the high school. It goes kind of close to the spine of that drive, right? Yeah, yeah, see the existing yeah. stadium? Yeah. It's in the center of the existing stadium. That's no, what I thought it was, it's not? On the driveway. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> so, I mean, it goes. It goes there. from the the DPW. There's an opening, and there's an opening over by. Yeah, there we go. This is the matter. That's what I thought. It's over closer to the DP, between the two it's DPW by the, buildings. By the driveways, exactly, and it works between the DPW and and the in our driveway on off Mill Street. Yeah. If you think about it, the existing stadium is not within a jurisdictional area, so it's correct. You know, it's it's, it's much it. further. It's right, so you can yeah. see right there. That's cell vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> so it's, it's... Uh... And you... Right. you see the toilet the, the, the existing toilet room that's that little concession. square, the concession mm -hmm. right above the word Mailbrook. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's still on our plan, that little box. Yes. Okay, so yeah, David, can you switch back to the conceptual plan? Yeah. That's that box. Yeah. And then yeah. go That's a plan of reference. All right. And so see the little white box right near the yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's just below that. Yeah. 
straight through there. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. So, so where is the port? Can can somebody put their cursor where the port, the so, sampling port right is? Right oh, it's there, down there. The port, okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's before drain manhole, right? So it's it's the whole drain system where we go through the filter train and worked its way through the field and then leaves via the 12 inch line, we'll put a port in it and it goes through a drain manhole, ties into the drainage that's in the in the driveway and eventually overflows as you get closer to the preschool to Millbrook. Right, so it just wasn't clear where the port was. So now Understood. it's clear because that was yep. new. Okay, thank yep. you. And we, thank but you. To, we gave a reference without a plan, which we can do of drain manhole five. So no, that's all okay. The plans, all the plans the commission has has where that is so we know sure. prior to that sure now um does anything else drain into that besides no. the field okay that that's why we picked that spot yeah. okay and it's not new it's what our design has always been we're just adding a basket to that location we're adding a, we're a, adding port. a port a port, well, a port. the port yeah. is yeah. now yes yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the, yeah. the new no. things tonight the amendment tonight so we're clear right are the drain baskets that's what we're asking approval for and yeah. the port and right. we're asking for the extension. So it's really straightforward. It's amend you vote to amend the the to add these items. To add these ahead. items, which we have talked about in the fourth April 4th meeting. We talked about it for a second or two in the meeting two weeks ago, and we talked about it in more depth tonight. That's that's what you're we've talked about this. It's the, the baskets and the port. I think the and commission understands the updated the, the addition. operation and maintenance plan. Correct. That's already in there that we have by, by the conditions we have to submit that. Yeah. No, no, I'm just saying that's that would we, be another uh, kind uh, of change. I make a, yeah. I make a motion no, 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 no. to, I make we a motion to uh, Chuck, approve Chuck, to amend the. <laughs> so I make I make a motion to amend. And and a motion to amend. Can I get a second? Second. I get a motion to amend. And I get a second. What what, con what conditions? Any conditions, David, on your motion? Um, I believe they, they put in, so I guess my condition would be, you know, they check the baskets as they reference in the operation and maintenance plan. And I, yeah, I, 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 Susan, I'm not sure I can condition the sampling until there's a, an approved method. So I, I wouldn't have a, a condition uh for um for testing until that um until the field is built and there's an approved method would you consider um brian's amendment of giving a year i would and then and then proposing the um the same it's proposing testing using the same type of protocols, monitoring protocols as in the Wilmington order of conditions, which is what I propose. I'm not sure the, the commission has seen that, Chuck. Uh, it was sent out. It was sent out. Was I, sent I got out. it from okay. the website. Yeah. Okay. So okay. We're, we're giving it a year. What does that mean? <laughs> we're gonna not test for a year? Um, Explain your condition a little bit more. Okay, so if the draft method, this is a compromise, if the draft method 1634 is not finalized within the first year of the installation of the field, then they have to start monitoring anyway using the draft method. If it's finalized before that, they have to start testing using the final method. David Kaplan, is that all right with you? It is. And I, and I will there second. Is there a frequency <laughs> to be specified, or is that covered in the methodology? The frequency was, was in my draft <laughs> um, special condition, and we're modifying the draft special condition, not requiring a baseline level. So we'd have to compare it to a non-detect. Unless there's can, a regulatory standard. Did, you, did everyone have a chance to go over uh, Susan's? Yeah. Uh, can, 
Sure. Can we do the vote? Don't we have a couple of weeks to issue? Don't we? Yeah. Can't we special have, conditions? discuss the, the special the conditions. conditions? Okay. So, so the, just the reason why I wanted to, we don't have to talk about the details, but for me to be able to vote, I, I need to understand that we are going to put special conditions on the testing. Uh, okay. Loosely, as we've said. We agreed to the so, David, you would have to withdraw yes. your just, uh, just one thing, uh, Chuck, motion. Chuck, we've, we've agreed to the frequency of the testing. We're all in agreement on it. If, if, if it's a two-year extension of the order of conditions, that takes us to August 4th, 2026. And that actually the field is opening in September of 2025. So what what... I just want to be clear. I think we need to be clear on when that testing would take place. It would take place, you're saying, in the within the first year after the the the, the expiration of the of the first order conditions on August fourth, two thousand and twenty six. What is the date, David Kaplan? You're you're making the motion. What is the date you're thinking? Well, I'm I'm deferring to a compromise proposal by yeah, another so you, commissioner. So yeah, I, what I heard was it's a year after the field is installed. So, so September 2026, you would need to start sampling and unless the EPA put out their final method. If they put out their final method in October 2025, then you have to start sampling then. And I will say that- Yeah, we agree, we agree, we're good. Okay, okay. Okay. And then we also we also agreed to remove no. that we, third we condition. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry. We got a caucus here. Hang on. Well, Susan, I think what you're saying is that testing would begin no later than August 2026. And okay. if the finalized EPA protocols come out before that, then they would have to begin sampling as soon as possible after that. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Like, I mean, it would be probably cleaner to require it before the ex expiration of the permit. Though we're saying that if if we're agreeing to this yeah yeah that would probably make sense well it'll be continuing condition right so that right it'd be continuing condition mm -hmm. right okay you're right are you saying that you're going to remove uh condition number three i i'm thinking that with the street sweeping and the fact that there is no grass around you know natural grass around the field or is that not true uh, there is something around the field that looks like grass uh, from the plan, but it was yeah. a conceptual plan. So then if there's grass around the field, I think we're concerned that the street sweeper isn't going to get it. If it's all concrete around the field, then the, the street sweeper will get it, right? Yeah. All right. Can we, guys, can we uh, stick on the testing thing, get that wrapped up? Oh, okay. Before okay. Before we move on. It's sure. getting confusing. Yeah. So, it's kind of getting late, but... Yes. Yes. So. Did the did the building committee caucus and have a response yeah. on the on the on the uh, yeah the town manager is going to speak to that. Thank you, Nathaniel. I, yeah, I think we were confused. We are in agreement that as soon as there is a validated test, that as soon as that validation is made public, we would employ that test immediately, and at the frequency specified in the Wilmington condition. Yeah. But there is generally opposition to using the draft mm -hmm. testing method. Okay. At all. Think... Well, there's some. With, with no, so so we could go 10 years and you won't test. Could, could I ask a question about um, what, in order for the test to be usable, it has to determine that some level of the 6PBDQ is harmful mm -hmm. to yeah. the aqua, aquatic life in Millbrook, I, I would assume, not any aquatic life that is, you know, in Mexico. Um, so if we go by the draft method, what has that established a, 
um, a, a toxic, toxicity level that is harmful to the aquatic life in Millbrook? No. So, so using what? a method and you, so, so we would compare, well, you're saying nothing's coming off. We're saying the only scientific data we have so far shows very low levels per per billion. So, so we're saying if you get a de detect, we have to be concerned. Now we can negotiate and talk about, and this would be a separate discussion, what the levels should be. Should they be the level of the trout, which is a part per billion level? Probably shouldn't be the coho salmon, which is a part per trillion level. That doesn't make sense. So if EPA has not established a level along with finalizing the method, those are two different things. There's a regulatory level and then there's the method. So it seems that what we're talking about is that testing would commence as soon as EPA comes up with the final protocol. Is that right? Yeah. So that's what I said, but but comparing it to something, that's why I wanted a baseline. Because if you compare it to a baseline and it's higher than your baseline, then obviously the field input something. So if, the, if you if, don't have a regulatory level, but you said we can't get a baseline. So then the baseline is a non-detect value if you expect you don't have any six PPDQ there right now on the site. So if we, did we agree that we can't do the testing until the field is in place? Yes, obviously. I think we did. Mm -hmm. The port's yeah, that's not obvious. in place. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone understands that. Is everyone clear on that? We can't, you I can't just want to make sure. Yeah. 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 Well, no let me just ask one out. question, Jeff. So you put you put the stormwater system in. All the PVC pipes and the baskets and everything in the port goes in before the carpet. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to get a sample before you put the carpet on because everything else is in place or no? It, well, it's it's a stone surface. It's a crushed it's, stone it's surface. Crushed stone. It's like what they put on underneath the driveway mix. It's crushed stone. If it rains, and, it's going to work its way through. It won't get to the system. Yeah. So you won't get, it, you'll get, the, what you report on is the, the rainwater and the stone. That's what your soil, sam your sample will get. Well, you won't even get the stone because that will just. Right. Oh, I see. You won't be picking up the crumb rubber. Yeah. yeah. There's no crumb yeah, right. rubber. No, but that's okay because right. your baseline is no crumb rubber. Oh, right, right, right. That's what I'm saying. Your right. baseline is just your rainwater going through your system. So, that's mm -hmm. your baseline. That's your background. We won't. We won't. We're, we're not guaranteed and unlikely to get enough rain to oh. do that. Okay. Well, I, I, I would think our, our baseline, if we're concerned about the impact of, yeah. if we're concerned about the impacts of the resource, I would think our baseline would be the concentration in Mill Brook at the point of discharge. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right. But, that's right. Okay. but I made the analogy before that if you have high levels in Mill Brook, that doesn't necessarily mean right. you don't want to add to them, but it could. But we're, we're, we're looking for a marginal impact or, you know, uh, so mm -hmm. if it's higher after the system goes in, we could continue to monitor Mill Brook plus the port. We get a sense of what's coming off the field and what that relative impact is to the discharge point well, I'm of Mill okay Brook. With that as a relative impact. I think that's a good compromise. I am concerned about additive um so, for example, if Millbrook ends up with um, 10 parts per billion of 6 PPD quinone we're, we're, so we're, coming uh, right in the brook, and that's and and then and then routinely we get off on stormwater events on this field eight parts per billion. That's still concerning because they're at, you're adding to that 10. But I do understand what you're saying, and and maybe we have to start somewhere. So, so we're making a supposition of, right. of what might add and throwing numbers out, right? Which right, I, again, because we don't discussion, know. We don't have I'm gonna go, you speak, I speak. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I, I, you spoke, I'm going to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're making a supposition. We don't want to make suppositions. We also don't want the Conservation Commission making decisions on how many parts per billion happen in Millbrook versus what comes off and how that affects the aquatic life in Millbrook. We want the EPA to set a regulation for that. So there's no question on our end or your end of, of what is detectable, what is the effect of what happens if it reaches a certain level. The EPA could say, 
that it is an accumulative effect. If it goes to this certain level, you need to do A, B, and C. And we also want to make sure when the EPA says you need to do A, B, and C, we do A, B, and C. We don't want to have this question of what needs to be done. They're going to give that guidance because guess what? There's crumb rubber fields throughout the United States that the EPA is looking at for this. So they're going to set this guidance. We want to follow the guidance. We don't want us or the commission setting the numbers, okay? And, and that's what we're saying we will absolutely agree to. We have not disagreed at all with no matter how much it costs that we will test every month once it's established for the first mm. year. And quarterly, we've followed all of that. The only thing we're really disagreeing about is whether or not the standards are set by the EPA or by a draft method that was done somewhere else. And, and we want the EPA to just set a regulation. We have a tough time agreeing to something that could be changed and doesn't exist. And, you know, Susan's even said multiple times they don't know enough about this yet to understand the effects. I right. hear what you're saying. It, it makes a lot of sense. I, Can... I don't want to lose the opportunity of getting okay. the data but I see what you're saying. What do you compare it to? And what you compare it to may have to wait for a standard. I see what you're saying. So I mean, we're have, not toxicologists. We're not going to make that up. We so we have a mo motion. Of <clears throat> getting the data. Sorry. We have a, hold on. We have a motion on the table. And I think that David Kaplan wants to think about it. But these are the, these are the two things as I see it out there. We have Susan's list of uh, conditions. She's taking away number three because it's talking about crumb rubber and migration of tum ru crumb rubber. And there's enough hard surface between here and Millbrook to accept the fact that the uh, um, street sweeping will take care of that. So one through two, starting one year after that, that protocol starting one year after the uh, field is installed, that's August, 2026. The other example we have out there is to um, make a motion to test to Susan's standards as soon as the EPA sets the testing for the 6PPD Queenom, and that could be 10 years away. So those are the two things I heard out of this discussion, and I think David can either take one up or or... Can so I, Nathaniel, yeah. sorry, I was just saying, I think it was EPA or DEP was the app was what was mentioned. I heard it was the EPA. Standards. Yeah, so I don't EPA, folk, people focus on EPA, but I thought uh, someone's uh, one of Jeff's slides said DEP or EPA setting the standard. I'm seeing said, uh, Chrissy yeah. say yes to yeah, so DEP. We, we, we said either or in whatever was more stringent. We said we would we would follow Thank the you. more stringent yeah. protocol. Okay. State Thanks. of Massachusetts okay. EPA. We, we, that's the language that we're proposing. And as Thank soon you. as yeah, it wasn't in front of me, I was just doing that from memory. I wanted to make yeah. sure Chuck was good, good memory. And, and the one thing I will say is that we've talked about one year or 10 years or something to that nature. Susan seems very confident that the draft methodology is, is very sophisticated and is unlikely to change. I would think that would mean very closer to one year than 10 years, if you think of it that way, <laughs> being yeah. established. Right, so David. there's a confidence there that it's close. Well, then it's it's close. If my concern is until it's validated, how, how do you yes. screen out false positives or false negatives? Or isn't that the a latter stage of the validation or process of an analytical method? Or if there's a different additive or something they need to do to how they measure it. Right. We, we take we can take samples, but until we know what to test and how to test. I, I think I, we're at the point where I we just, really need to make a vote. Make a, a yeah. I think if we wait till a final approved method, it could be years. And we'll never know what happened in the meanwhile. Can I just make a clarification? There are two things here that are getting pushed together. There's the method and there's a standard. Okay. A toxicity standard or regulation. Those are two okay. different things. They don't get promulgated at the same time. Right. I agree that we shouldn't maybe compare the levels we get off in the port to any made up standard because that can change. I, I, I acquiesce to that. I think that those are good arguments. What I don't agree with is that we should not start collecting data 
on draft methods because the method isn't gonna change very much. And at least we have some data to build up over the years to see where we are. We won't take action on it. Okay, this is a compromise. Don't take action until we either yeah. get an EP <clears throat> or an EPA standard to compare that to, but at least collect the data. We just keep the data. And submit it to the Conservation Commission and yourself. So where are we with this motion? Well, yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're seeing if um, Wait a minute, you know, just, the, just the applicant will agree to use a draft method. Yeah. Susan, if I understand correctly, if, if it is simply such that once the field is built, are we willing to pull a sample from that port and have it tested, even if the method is still draft? Right, I and you do the frequency that, that we had stated. I think I could agree take out the background so and take out... So long as understanding yeah. that that the results of which are not actionable. Not actionable it, it, at this it, it time until the, and if there is an a is for the collection of information. And, and as soon as there is, yeah. we would yeah. Right, right, right. We agreed if we can we can collect the information and we'll sample and test it is if if it's just an FYI and it is it's, in it's, no it's, way it's actionable. building data also, which is exactly. great for the commission. It's building Absolutely. a data set. And then when it's actionable, then we'll have to have another conversation because that's got to be built into the, you know. If it, if it is the regulation, then the actionable is, is defined. Exactly, and that's yeah. what we it, it's, do. it's a regulation anyway. We, yeah. When we say in here that we're going to follow the, the EP or the DEP protocol, in, including the testing protocol and the actions that have to be taken in the event of a test that's negative or that's not favorable. But we'll change to say we will do the testing per the current protocol of the draft and that the actionable item is going to be per regulation. Yeah, there you go. Okay. It, that it can't say the method detection limit because that is simply the minimum possible concentration detected right. using that method. Right. It's we, not indicative we, of a potential harm. Right. We, we already talked about that. We said that's, that's impact. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's it, it goes on a toxic level with a toxic chemical list. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that said, I think I will withdraw my motion. I will allow somebody to make a more mm. articulate one. Yeah. That that uh synthesizes all of that. That's pretty good. Move that the conservation commission accepts Jeff, the amendment to the order of conditions. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give us a <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't think they can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, sorry, that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. Suggestions. <laughs> that's that's the, the that's the we'll give you credit for that. No, I don't. Don't bold. say it. Yeah. Guys. Okay. Don't say it. So, yeah. um, okay. So, uh, so I'll make and then I think the understanding is is that we would, you know, we're going to follow using the language that's in here. We're going to, um, you have language in here and the letter from uh, to Chuck from Steve about the stormwater filter baskets. You have language in there about sampling. Mm -hmm. um, you have language in there about us using uh, either one or both of the US EPA or Mass DEP standards. And all you need to add is <clears throat> um, we will test within the first year of uh, the field being uh, being uh, in place. That's all you're adding. Uh, yeah, yeah. With no actionable yeah. items. There's no actionable item until there is a standard, but we will we will we will do do testing. Yeah. Right. So, and and plus adopting the uh your maintenance plan that you submitted. Absolutely. But the maintenance plan is okay. Yes. Right. Fair yes. Enough. yes. Okay, maintenance plan. All right. So there you go. I'll make uh, I can't remember all that at this late hour. I'll make a motion that uh the maintenance plan is adopted, the uh changes in the stormwater uh treatment train are uh adopted uh, specifically that uh, the yes. testing port is inserted the basket design is inserted and that is regard for testing uh testing will begin one year after the field is uh, you know, finished put in place and it will use the methodology uh, that susan discussed about discussed uh, and it will be done at the frequency in the draft uh, draft condition from the Wilmington project, and that once a standard is promulgated by DEP or EPA, uh, oh. we'll have what have a discussion about whether what you know compare the data to, to that standard. And Until then, there will be no actionable items right. and a friendly amendment. We are withdrawing Susan's number three. 
two on her. Yes, I, I didn't include right exactly. I did not. Well, number two is gone as well, Chuck. So okay, you were you were using the frequency outlined in in standard one. So minus two and three. Just get it in the record. Yep. Second. So we have a motion. Do you have a second? Second. Great. Uh, David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Mike Gildas game. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Great. I'll make a motion to extend the permit. Two years. Uh, I'm going to ask the applicant for the sake of everyone's sanity. Are you sure you don't want three years? Okay. Why don't we do it for three? Yeah, why don't we do it for three? Hang on, two two points of order here. So One, do we we officially need to open the hearing on the and also oh, yeah. also oh, we yeah. didn't close the previous hearing. We just voted, so yeah. we couldn't. So we we're gonna okay. we're, we're, we're motion, to move, move to close the hearing on which we already voted on. We <laughs> second. <laughs> Before I guess you can do that, but let me come back for the clarification about the timing of the permits. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. David David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Closed and issued. David Morgan. I, can you open the next one? Um, I thought it was open. I didn't know there was an official opening of these things, the but uh, uh, hold on a second. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I'm opening the extension, uh, DEP file number 9332, uh, order of conditions 869, Massachusetts Avenue, yeah, Arlington High School. The applicants request a uh, extension of three years to the existing order of conditions. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Susan Chapnick. Just, just, just a point of comment. That's the existing <laughs> order of conditions with the amendments that were just recently voted on. Yes, correct. Yes. Thank correct. You. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, After. sorry. Hold on, Chuck. David has, Morgan has a procedural it, point. It, yeah, this is the point of order, and I missed it because I was referencing our regulations. Was the motion for two years or three? Three. three. We can't extend more than three years from the original. This would two. Right? Technically, I'll read this to oh, you. Oh, so it has to be two again. No, you're right. Two. You're right, because yeah. we already added a year. That's what it is. Yeah. The commission two. may extend a permit for a period of up to an additional three-year period yep. from date of issue. But hold on, David. This is an extension after we just amended it. So that doesn't that doesn't apply. It's a it's essentially a brand new order of conditions. Oh. So we can do three years. Three years from the amended order of conditions. Maybe okay. that's yeah. what you say. So three years is not fine. the original order of conditions. So what's the motion? Uh, the motion is to extend the Arlington High School permit for three years. And it was from the motion, amended motion, order of conditions. From the amended order of conditions. Nathaniel, is that acceptable to you to revise your Sure. I, I can't remember if I, I, it's so late. I can't remember if I made the motion, but yes. You did. Yes, you did. Okay. I think it was Mike Gildas game seconded. That's fine with me. I'm hoping. Yes. Uh, Brian McBride. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. Uh, David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Woohoo. Great, thank you. Um, just to clarify the next steps, David Morgan and, and Steve kind of go back and forth on the to make sure the language there's no errors in the language or what happens next. Yes, David has yeah. uh, 21 days to issue the decision. Um, yeah, I think he can certainly he'll yeah he'll circulate a draft internally, and I guess we're, we're happy to share one with you. Well, okay, we'll look at the draft to make sure we're all clear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a good meeting. Bruins yeah. lost. Long. Three, three, yeah. Jack. Tie it up. You're an ass. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. Second. Second. Uh -huh. You are. All right. All right.
Chuck, okay. anything else? No, no, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.